Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 324 of Spitting Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Boston Sports Podcast family. Boys, it's great to be home again. We hit Jupiter, Florida. We hit Manhattan. We hit North Jersey. I know the wit dog's still on the road, but first time in three weeks we're doing the show at home. Mike EG, nice to, nice to be in your apartment last week. Better to be home. How's it going, buddy? Uh, great to be in New York City this weekend. The weather was fantastic. Broke out the ra- rollerblades for the first time this season. Boys, a lot of big plans for the Blade Gang this summer. Huge plans coming. So I'll leave it there. Face plants? <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> All right. Biz Nasty, what's up, buddy? You must be feeling like Chief. me right now. Great to be back on the big cheer. I've been Fun fucking to go on the road. slept. Haven't fucking slept since Mr. Shvechnikov in Grinelli's apartment. All right, going to be honest. <laughs> I haven't had a wink of goddamn sleep since that happened. I will redeem myself. And I word, when, but I will. word is he could be going back to Russia because of it. RA is responsible for a One possible deportation. Who already no, kidnapped his brother if I can run home because of it? <laughs> It, it was a, it was a great relaxing weekend. I mean, I celebrated my birthday on March 11th. Thank you to all the wonderful people who reached out to wish me a happy birthday. I'm sorry I couldn't get back to all of you, but uh, it was a good one. I got to hang out and I, I did a hike this weekend with Mister Fin again, and and, I uh, love you. and it was it was relaxing, boys. I'm uh, I got all the partying and craziness out of the way at the beginning of my life. Now I'm just uh, now I'm just an old man. Yeah. He's still busted out every once in a while, though. I don't uh, know last- if he can. I don't know if he oh. can. He might be a changed man. Oh, I'm a changed man. Shit. That's the voice of Ryan Whitney, the wit dog. You're still in Florida. You are coming home soon. And you were at Disney World earlier today, which is Sunday. We're recording. I was in RA. You're, uh, you're, you're misinformed. Okay. What the plan is, is uh, for myself to be about as in one as humanly possible tomorrow. And that's a day at Disney World. So... I always said I actually um, I want to bring up we're, we're bringing on Keith Yandel. You know, I don't. Did you just say that? Ray? I did not. You did. OK. All right. I'm glad I'm glad I, I, I remembered. And he's involved in this. What I'm going to tell you this story. But we brought him on. So you're going to hear about him. Talk about getting his thousand game ceremony. It was a great interview. But when he first went to Disney World with his kids, when he got home, I said, how was it? He's like, dude, it was unbelievable. There's like these VIP passes or like something. I think there's like fast passes and there's even big dog. There's an even bigger dog that just walks you around. So you don't have to wait in any lines. Some of these lines, six hours long, Biz. Just and to so, ride the teacups. I don't know about the teacups, probably like the uh, Harry yeah. Potter ride. I'm guessing the teacups aren't busting out the big lines anymore, but he was like, dude, this is unbelievable. Whenever you go, someday you have kids, this is what you got to do. So at the in the middle of the trip, you know, when we were in Jupiter, I said, oh, well, we're so close. Why don't we just drive up to Disney World for Ryder? He'll love it. It'll be unbelievable. And I was like, what a great idea. Now, I didn't think right away that you got to wear masks the whole time. And it's like 90 degrees. So that was the first one. I was like, oh, man, like even when you're outside, you got to have it on whatever. I'll survive. Well, then like a hammer to the back of the head. I looked in to everything and saw there's no VIP passes. There's no fast passes. COVID has those things dead to rights right now. They're gone. Apparently fast pass is like possible to get. I've looked into it. I don't think it is. So I am going tomorrow with my son, who's going to be absolutely sensory overload in love with the place. But, He's three years old and three. You don't exactly understand like what the line is. <laughs> so I'm in one. People say on one. I say in one. I can't wait to report back to you, but tomorrow's day one and uh, wish me luck. Now the confusion RA, cause you thought that he'd already been, I saw you post a picture in yeah. front of a, 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 a T-Rex ride or something. What was that? So today we went over to Disney Springs, which is like all these like restaurants and shopping. And listen, version. when you see Disney people, Disney people stick out. It's unreal. Like, you know, like there's couples like where are the kids? Nope. They're just in their Disney Mickey and Minnie shirt. And they're both 43 years old from Iowa. And they're walking down the street and just in their Disney people like Disney people are a real life thing. So we went over there because he loves dinosaurs and there's like this dinosaur like lunch place and you build a dinosaur like it's build a teddy bear type thing and you know you name them it's just one of those days where it was like the warm-up it was basically mm-hmm. pre-game skate before a big game okay a little dynamic stretch get ready get your hips ready for, oh, for dude, my hips and then you know my feet and i got the hernia um yeah but i made i made a, i had to make a, a promise i cannot and will not 
complain one time tomorrow. Or it could be uh did did Bree Cur- make it could you- be it could be curtains for your boy Ryan. Did did Bree make you promise that? She looked me in the eye and said, Hey, I need to talk to you about something. I said, What happened? She said, You have to promise me that you will not complain one time Wait, at Disney World. Can you just and I bottle and I said, can you I said, bottle I said can I play golf two times while we're there? <laughs> and she said, Yes, when we get in Saturday you can play and then go play Tuesday. We're Monday and Wednesday at the park. You are smiling, Ryan, and you are not complaining. Can you bottle up? I promised her, and that, that'll be the case. Can so you, I don't know what I'm going to do. Sorry. Can I bottle up what? I apologize. You, well, I was going to say, can you bottle up the complaints and save them for next podcast? I'll just I write them down on my phone. I'll Notes. write them down on my phone. Yeah, put them all in the, but, in, in the fucking memo pad. Hey, but it's all about seeing, you know, you're seeing your son have a, have a great time. He's already, he's got, he's just like... He's buzzing. He's like moving his feet during the uh, the national anthem, like you know when you're just trying to get that nervous energy out. So I'll report back to you next week. Yara, All right. The- have you have you been to uh, Disneyland? Oh is yeah. It Disney World or Disneyland? Well, Disney World that- lands in L.A. It's Di- trash. Yeah, Disney World is Florida. Disneyland is California. But you are at the complex itself, though, right? Wet Disney World, like the whole- and you're staying on campus basically. For- no, I'm at oh, a not hotel that's not on campus. Okay, all right. Well, either way, yeah, the whole you can stay in the complex biz. I I went as a kid, and it's it's great when you're a kid to see it because it's such a fabled place. But my cousin got married there a few years ago, and then me and my wife like, oh, we went back to check it out, and then like we went as an adult. And it's like, okay, I'll probably never go back again. I mean, yeah. get, kind of been there, done that. But I will say the Tower of Terror. I think they redid it. That's a fucking probably the best ride there. Unreal that, ride. Or, or the Aerosmith roller coaster is legit. So yeah, I heard that's that. sick. Here's the, the thing, though, t- Biz. Oh, go ahead. The Tower of Terror is that at Universal Studios or is that at Disney World? Well, it's at Universal Studios, which is one of the parks within the entire like, complex. Okay, like, okay. Because yeah. because I, I went as a kid too. That's when um, Indiana Jones was popular. So I got to yeah. watch the Indian. I'll never yeah, forget. Show. I spent my entire allowance day one on an Indiana Jones hat. Really? It's oh yeah. Sick lid. Oh, buddy. I thought I was jacket that you wear too. What do you mean? Like if you still, if it could still fit, you could rock a hat like that with that jacket you wear. It'd be a sick outfit. Oh yeah. No, oh, yeah. I got it. I mean, I think it's long gone now. What? Oh, uh, Ninja Turtles were big back then. So you, oh, and then and then, and then you would pizza. go and then you would go to the area where you could get the notepad and get all of their autographs. Yeah. So yeah, Walt Disney so, World is the whole. It's that whole the park itself. But then there's another name for the whole complex. But when when I was there, Biz, last time we were at Space Mountain, and the whole allure of Space Mountain is it's in the dock. It's a roller coaster in the dock, so you don't know where you're going. What don't know where you're going. When me and my wife were in line, some there was some sort of malfunction. They had to turn the lights on inside Space Mountain. It was like fucking seeing the biggest secret ever because they it was a malfunction. You could see all the layout of all the tracks, like the cars and stuff. It was like finding out this crazy, crazy secret. I took pictures and shit. Hey, you see leaks with like buckets collecting the water <laughs> and like X'd out <laughs> like signs on the wall. You're just like, oh, Space Mountain, sick. Yeah, they got their own fire department stuff down there, Biz. It's, oh, what, uh, what's the other one when you'd go in the little... But Biz, like hold it's on. It's a small world after, after all. all. That's a, it's yeah, a small that's world. a tough one. Oh. Um, I'll probably be doing that one tomorrow. Sorry for the long Disney talk, folks, but we just got, these fun. guys like talking about it. I just told them what was going on in my life. But Biz, six hours, six hours people wait in line for a five-minute ride. Like, is are you like... Could that sounds like one of could... my one of my dates back in the day. <laughs> I was say, try waiting fifteen all for that, five seconds. All that for nothing. <laughs> She's like, Annie didn't Roman. even pick up the bill. Jesus. Oh shit. All right. Well, moving right along. I mentioned we were on the road. Well, the last gig we had, uh, Wit was still in Florida. Me and Biz and G stopped by. We can't really get into it too much, but it was online. It was the Pink Whitney Cup. Uh, Erica was huge putting this together. Uh, it was an awesome day. There's going to be a video. Actually, I believe it's a video series that's going to drop. I can't wait for the footage. They had drones there. They had uh, Biz and Jake doing play-by-play. So there were some the people that were confused as to, to the fact that there was no pre-warning of, of what we were doing in New Jersey. But the whole premise of this is it was a content piece brought to you by Pink Whitney that we're going to br- – listen, guys, when the world opens back up, we're going to be doing the live pawn hockeys and these live events. We couldn't do it, so we figured we'd go a different route. And a great job by Erica and everybody at Barstool organizing this. Some amazing uh, uh, female hockey players joined us as well. We're going to keep everything a secret and until it's released but uh thank you for everyone at barstool and uh, all the um outside people for joining us during that uh, that uh, filming of it yeah we had 
four four Barstool personalities. They had a draft, and like you said, they had a lot of the, the best players there were all the young women that were there. I mean, we had Olympians there, D one players, uh, and it was just everybody had a fun day. I think I, hopefully that'll be conveyed through the video. All right, what was your role? Um, I basically played the uh, what the Pierre Maguire role. What would we say? I was the yeah. roving reporter. Wow. How would pre-game I wonder interviews. if the head. I wonder if the bald head there, like trying to say something there. Yeah, uh, I wasn't exactly gussied up like Pierre was because I really <laughs> didn't know what I was doing until I got there that morning. But um, it was fun. It was actually it, it was almost kind of like doing improv in a way because like I I was playing kind of like the serious role, but obviously joking. So I I had as much fun as anybody. I mean, I didn't play, but. I had a blast. We, you know, there was, uh, like I said, we don't want to talk about too much, but it, it was uh, everybody afterwards was talking about how much fun they had. A lot of people didn't know each other and they were like, like pals afterwards. So it, it was a good day. So we can't wait to drop that. And that's speaking of pink Whitney. Now that hockey is back, you're going to have to find your shot and what better way to do that than with our friends at pink Whitney from January 1st through March 26th. We are giving chicklets fans a chance to win a custom pink Whitney shot machine. All you have to do is post a picture of you and your Pink Whitney and use the hashtags, hashtag Pink Whitney, hashtag take your shot, hashtag sweepstakes. We'll be picking winners from the U.S. and Canada every other week, so make sure you get creative with your submissions. Those things look pretty fun. A uh, little bit of PR roundup. Biz, you appeared on PMT this week. Check uh, checked in with the boys while you are in New York. Great chat with the boys. Great seeing everyone and being live in studio. I, had, I hadn't been there in, I think, almost a year. So, uh, yeah, if you guys want to listen, I listen, I thought it was great. And I think that if we do have some new fans in the past, I don't know, year or whenever the last time you talked about it was your last game, that story is awesome. The first time you told it on here, I remember you got emotional and it was just like hearing it again, just a little more, a little more brief on part of my take. It's for anyone who has never heard that, go check it out. Wait, you made an appearance as well. I mean, you've been a soccer fan for five minutes and you're already making appearances on soccer shows. Yes, I was fired up already. I got invited to uh, go on the Chelsea Miked Up podcast. So I talk about how much I hate anyone who writes me that, like, don't talk about soccer when I've talked about it on here. Like, I can't, like, if I ever met you and you said that, like, I'd just be like, get away. Like, you're such a loser. But I got the chance to do it on that pod. And maybe I can get back on or maybe I can get into something or maybe I just like don't let these people affect me and I continue to talk. But Chelsea is on a roll. And we went on to talk about the new manager, a couple of the signings. I had a bunch of questions for these guys as I'm still like learning my way around the game. But I will say and I don't know if I said it on Chicklets, I think I've learned more about soccer in whatever it's been three or four months than any human has in the history of learning about soccer for three or four months. I got one quick soccer question. Now they weren't doing great. They fired their manager. Is there possibility that they can still win the overall? They can't win the league this year. Man city is just running away with it. Uh, Yeah. Man, man city. So, so good. They're the best team, but it's all about, well, it's all about winning the premier league, but, You got to finish top four, you get Champions League. And they're still alive in Champions League this year. And they're up 1-0 on Madrid, Atletico Madrid, in the round of 16. So they have a home game, too. They won on the road. It was a neutral site. But, yeah, I I, I love it. I'm all in. I finally have a team. I now understand, by the way, I won't chirp people anymore for saying we. Because I say we. This is the first time I've ever said really we about a team. Um, uh, is fan. Champions League, if you win that, more important than winning the British Premier League? That would be a great question that I'm I'm guessing it is bigger because it's it, you're winning the entire title in Europe. Or maybe, I mean, is it, it then there's teams in Russia, there's teams from Russia. No, yeah, I think I think Champions League is a bigger W, but but tweet me your opinion. And then I won't respond if you're mean and tell me not to talk about soccer. Me and Biz got to meet troops uh, at the aforementioned Pink Whitney Cup, and he is an electric factory. Oh, I got to meet that guy. He was like, screaming electric. at somebody in a restaurant last night. I saw. Oh, was that fucking... legit, or was they were they just talking soccer? I think it was an Arsenal watch party. So like the bar was bumping with Arsenal fans, okay. and he's just going at it with some guy. North London Derby. <laughs> yeah, I want about. Right? I want to go to battle with him. Absolutely. All right, moving back over to the news. Uh, We talked about this before. It's official ESPN and ABC are back in bed with the NHL. The league will partner with Disney through the 28th season. Uh, It's 400. The deal, according to the athletic is worth $400 million per year. Again, this is just the deal with uh, ABC slash ESPN. Uh, ABC is going to have four complete Stanley cup finals. They're going to air four of the next seven or eight, which is fantastic to have on, you know, one of the three major networks or four major networks like that. Uh, they're bringing the theme song back, which is awesome. Gary Thorne. He, he wants back in. I know he's 72 years old, but he's, he's open. He's not working for the Orioles anymore. 
Uh, Stephen A. Smith, he dropped that, what, four-minute video of top five reasons, like, he's psyched for hockey. Did you guys get a chance to see that? I know it kind of went pretty viral the other day. I did. Oh, I, I'm a huge Stephen A. guy. So, I mean, hey, it, like I said, we talked about it before, but it's official. And I know, you know, I, I'm a hockey fan. I've shit on ESPN as much as anybody. But, like, I, I tweeted that picture of uh, Don Colleone and what's his name? Uh, Tataglia hugging at the meeting in the Godfather. Like, just let bygones be bygones. Forgive everybody. And, you know, the league will be better on ESPN. They'll, they'll, they know, everybody knows they pimp their own products. If you're in bed with them, then they're going to, you know, we're going to see a lot more Connor McDavid and Austin, Austin Matthews on there. So from my understanding, I think that, uh, you know, given the pandemic and everything, they were maybe, a, I don't want to say disappointed with the number that they got. They, I think Bettman was hoping for more. But the good news about this, though, is there's still more TV rights to be sold, correct? Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, yep. people are saying NBC will probably still stay involved, and that could be for $200 million a year. So then you're looking at $600 million a year, and their old deal was two hundred. Go ahead, Biz. You can give your no, points. no, no. I was just, I was just more of asking a question. But at the, at the end of the day, this is just great for the league. Um, you know, more exposure, and and as you mentioned already, right, ESPN, the biggest sports network in, in the United States, like having that type of exposure where games are, especially important ones like playoffs and Stanley Cup games, are on at bars. It's just going to eventually elevate the play. And you know, I, I, I think that uh, yeah, hockey's definitely on the rise, and this was a big move by the league to get uh, to get the get more eyes involved. I love it. I, I, I you, that's very well said. And there's a lot of people who are like chirping, like who cares about the song? Like, I, I mean, nobody cares about the song, but it's an absolute banger. It's, it's a, a banger. classic. It's like this. It's almost as good as the song before the sandbaggers for that two minutes countdown. And I just think back to like ESPN was where I was watching hockey playoff hockey when I really fell in love with the game. 94 New York, New York Rangers. It was like just I just think of hearing that music and think back to all the big games and Lemieux on the Penguins. And yeah, it was so long ago. But where ESPN is and how many te- like they're they're on they're in every sports bar. Every bar has ESPN on. So there you go. It's just more eyes on hockey. I think it's great. And yeah, I, I would definitely agree that they probably were hoping for more money and look at it as a little bit of a disappointment, but that was all prior to COVID. So any anyone with a brain understands you can't try to even compare it now to what you um, thought. Are you they might bringing have. back Barry Melrose or, or Barry Melrose is really, still there? Yeah, yeah, Bouchergrass, very happy for my boy John Bouchergrass. He's a great guy and he's been drumming hockey as hard as he can for as long as he's been at ESPN since they got rid of it. But he used to host NHL tonight with Barry Melrose and then, you know, Ray Ferraro, I think maybe was on there at times, but that's a guy who's so fired up. Right. I mean, who knows? He's done, he's done the uh, play by play for the NCAA national title game for a long while now on ESPN. So we'll see where he ends up. And it's an exciting time because I, I think it's just, dude, remember when it was on OLN, the outdoor life network? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In like, that was my lockout. rookie year. Like I played on the OLN. Now we're on ESPN. Yeah, so I love it. That's a good point because that's the one channel that's on every bar, restaurant. You sit in the barber shop. It's always ESPN, and it's always you know the the highlights of the teams they're in business with. So, hey, the NHL is in business with them now. So we'll see them a lot more. Also, too, I don't know if you're aware. If you have Hulu, you can watch uh, ESPN Plus on your Hulu now, which. There have actually been games on ESPN Plus this whole season, actually the last two seasons. I don't know if people know that, but if you go on Hulu, you can actually watch NHL games on your Hulu too these days. So uh, worth worth noting also too, Biz, Fox is still in the running. I know everybody thinks NBC uh, is going to be the other partner. Right oh. now, they, I guess they're somewhat a part on money, but Richard Deitch, who covers uh, TV, I'm sorry, sports media for The Athletic, he said Fox is a dark horse, so they're not completely out it of it. It is crazy, TV. though. Fox doesn't have, after the Super Bowl, Fox has nothing. They have NASCAR. And, they do and baseball, call- right? Don't they do the World yeah, but Series? I'm saying, but I'm saying, but from February, whatever, fifth on, they have college basketball and, and NASCAR. They have nothing. So you, in, until, yeah, until springtime when baseball comes. So, yeah, you'd, you'd think they'd get involved. It is kind of weird. But, I, I, yeah, it, it, it was great news to see, and it, it seemed like that, that was going to be the case. You kind of heard the rumblings for a little while now. Yeah, and obviously their production is what it is. They do a great job with NFL and NBA. And like I said, we're happy to be back. Let's let bygones be bygones and everybody move forward and grow the game. Right, Biz? Let's fucking go, baby. Let's fucking go. All right, our buddy Keith Diendel, obviously he played in his thousandth game, as we mentioned. Well, he had his first game back in Florida. They were able to celebrate it. Uh, his team gave him a few gifts, and we got a uh, little FaceTime with him. So what do you say, boy? Send it over to KY right Let's now? Let's send her over. Yep. Jelly. All right. Here's our boy Keith Diendel. <laughs> 
welcome now to a special guest. One of our faves, Keith Yandel, is joining us. And thousand games played. He had a celebration Saturday night, March 13th, where I and Paul Bissonnette, amongst many others, spoke to say what a great guy and what an amazing career you've had now joins. Let's talk about it, buddy. How are you doing? How happy are you right now? Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thanks for the kind words from both you guys. Um, RA, appreciate you doing nothing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, they yeah, cut no. his. Did they? <laughs> I got kicked out of the alumni. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, on a serious note, though, I think After that the three, quarters of, three quarters of mine got, got cut off. I was ranting on and I'm like, yeah, I probably should have tightened it up and, and been less of a clown because because it was going out to the masses. No, it was great. I mean, it was you. Your, your voice squeaked and you made it. You're like, did my voice just squeak? <laughs> I'll send you the whole video afterward. I whipped my yeah. cock out and shit. The Maybe best that was, was uh, Radar, Ray Bork. He just like, you know this face, Keithy. Oh, yeah. Hey, in his pool, <laughs> like right by his pool. just. Like- oh, yeah. Barbecuing. Just yeah, yeah that that was that was special too. Obviously, with having the legend uh, Bubba Bork himself, but uh, yeah, you got you guys killed it as always. So and, you, you got to be honest. Sorry, all right. Um, right. You had you had no idea about the song shirts, or you had heard something. Or what I had you no that? clue, no Those clue. Things I are swear fresh. to God. Oh, they're insane. How metallic is that silver up in the song? It's juice, it's juice. It really is. Yeah, yeah so we I, charge I, your I, credit I card for those. So just just give me the heads up now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get them on the right. barstool sports store. <laughs> That's all right. I saw I, the charge. I did um, retweet. I did retweet the picture, Keith. I, I I at least did that, anyways. Oh, appreciate you. Uh, hey. Yeah, no, I came into the locker room and I saw those hanging. I saw one of the guys had it on, and I literally had to walk out of the locker room because I was I was gonna cry. Oh really? Oh yeah. I was, saw I mean, your quote. I saw your quote after, and we, like. It was just so cool to see, dude, you know, how, how how long we've known each other. And it was just like seeing the video of that many teammates that you've just, you know, made a difference in their lives. It was awesome. And all the guys back home, our Stormers, our crew, we were just like yeah. so proud of you. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you felt that way. But you got to also kind of fill us in on this golf cart situation. Will this thing be allowed oh. at like uh, your home course? Uh, one of them, I big? think it is <laughs> one of them. I think it's allowed at, uh, which I've, I've seen people drive their own golf cart there. Cause a lot of people in Florida just drive them around and you can, you can, uh, I don't know if it has the hookup for the bag. I won't even bring clubs. I think you can put thing. the, um, you can put the license plate on it and be like driving it on Las Olas though. You won't see me driving a car. Yeah. I will be strictly, I'm, I'll be the guy you ever see in Las Olas. They shuttle people back and forth to like the hotels. That'll be me. It's like three fifty, but you gotta, you gotta tip. Them. No, no. Free 99. <laughs> hey, 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 when you retire, you could be like the people in uh, in Scottsdale who drive the people around to bars. Or is that kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, kind of the exact same oh, thing safety. that I just said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> drive, drive up to the villages, go looking for gilfs with that fucking thing. What's I'll, what's Las uh, Solas? That's a street. It's like the Florida main Lauderdale. street, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, How pimped Buzz, out is Buzz it? Buzztown. It's, it's it? insane. It's It's got like a, it's got a backup camera. It's got uh, like a little, it's got like basically a little iPad on the front. Uh, it hums. It goes like thirty miles an hour. I took we took it we took it for a ride around the rink last night. It was unbelievable. <laughs> like eight guys on it after the game in the song shirts. It was great. Bumps music. It has like a you could watch movies on it. Uh, cooler in the back. The thing is insane. So nice actually to get a dub in that game because before the before it was it was kind of a long like ceremony. I was like, he must be like, oh my god, way to get this game started. My legs are yeah. like a jelly. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it's one of those things you, especially like when the spotlight's on you, you're like, oh god, you just kind of want it to end. To not you know what I mean? Your... But, but it, yeah, exactly. Uh, but like, there's man, like we had a lot of thousand games in, in Phoenix, and like being a part of them, I think is so cool. And like, I remember being so excited for guys, and guys were like that with me, and it was like. It meant the world to me how, how much the guys loved it. Uh, I would say besides Biz being upset about the money he's losing, <laughs> like you are so genuinely happy for guys because I think once you play, I don't know, like what, 30, 40 games in the league, maybe at one season, you realize how many games a thousand is. Like Biz, mm-hmm. would you not? I remember, I remember, I don't know, in my fourth year being like, holy shit, I'm at like 220. This guy's got a thousand. So. Yeah. 
I think that's what's so special is that you do feel bad that it takes so long, but you had to know everyone was just very. I had to retire because that's just too many loads in my belly button for pregame. <laughs> Hey, hey, but on a serious note, though, the reason we had you on is we want you to count to a thousand like Patrick Kane did. So uh, just you could start now. He can't get yeah. past seven. He's, he's more educated than I am, I would imagine. I, 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 we'd be here for a while. They should have put your cat, your, um, what is it, cap friendly fucking career earnings on for the license plate. It had like 17 numbers on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Looked like a license plate in England. <laughs> they give you a Rolex, too, didn't they? What? Yeah, the team the team got me what? a Rolex. Kevin Seven Hayes them, bought bro. me a Rolex. Yeah, Kevin oh Hayes with the classiest move. He's got two fucking Rolexes in a vehicle. He's already sold one of them. I'm making a comeback. So, Fuck yeah. this shit. <laughs> so Hazy Hazy sent it to Kristen and gave it to me on the on the game on the day of the game. And obviously, I was showing it off to all the guys and like show, I'm like, dude, Hazy just bought this watch. It's unbelievable. It's a, like nicest thing one individual has ever done for me. Just like. He was, I was reading the text and Chris, I was like, cr- I like, couldn't even get through the text. Like, and, um, so I was showing the guys obviously on the game during the, before the game, I'm like, yeah, he's, and they were all like, they were waiting to give me my Rolex yesterday. And they're like, oh man, like this guy thinks we didn't get him anything. But I, I was like, I didn't even like think that they were like, you must've thought we were a joke. I'm like, I actually didn't even think it like twice about it. <laughs> I didn't think I was getting anything, you know? Uh, yeah, I got two watches. I made out like a bandit. Yeah, we started we, shaking we, we, there for a second when you said they didn't buy anything. He's no, like, I've what? seen it. I already got it off the truck for Hazy. That's how we, that's how we, <laughs> yeah. it. it came, yeah, it came with deal. the Alpine that we put in the golf cart for him. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also, you sunk the cameraman out too. I mean, first game back at home after a thousand, you sunk the cameraman. How appropriate. What was that? Have you seen this? this Yo, you haven't seen it? Yeah, you kind of no. song. You had like two songs, one to a player, one to a cameraman. You you fake passed it from behind the net up the right side. The cameraman bit like an absolute like Muppet. Like the camera just rips left. Then it goes back to you and you realize you hadn't moved the puck. And you're carrying it up ice. And you kind of song to drop pass to somebody. And all of a sudden, there's a video of some little kid watching it with his dad. And the kid is like seven. He's like, so no, I thought there was an earthquake. It was, it was, so that was the worst seven-year-old voice a human being's ever done. But yeah, that's for the video. I'll send it to you. Yeah, I gotta see what is. Yeah, if it was on like Twitter or anything, I didn't see it. So that's awesome. I gotta see it. Um, as, as far as the game went, I, I ended up watching most of it. Fucking Barkov, dude. Holy. Yeah, shit. he's a joke. These guys, it's fucking nuts, dude. He he played five minutes on the penalty kill, two forty on the PP. He's relied upon in every single situation. Yeah, yeah, he they he's gonna play goalie next game. Oh, is he? Okay, nice. Yeah, cool. he's gonna get the start. The, the the guy he's he is one of the most insane hockey players I've ever seen. Like just all aspects of the game, defensively, his st- he gets like ten takeaways a game, and then get never takes penalties. Just like he's an absolute horse, wins draws. It's insane. He's he's and, and he's the best guy in the world too. And obviously a, a big reason for the team's overall success. You guys are playing some great hockey. I mean, I know it's a pretty tough division at the top with, with Carolina and, and Tampa Bay, but like just overall, how, how's the season been going? And, and like, you know, what, what's, what's the room like? And, and, and I guess just kind of fill us all in. Yeah, it's been great. Uh, obviously it's a good start for us. I think we're halfway through right now. And, um, you know, obviously we're in a position that we're, that we want to be in being in, you know, in the playoff picture right now, but uh, with a tough division, I mean, you play in the same teams, it's tough. You got to play the good teams basically every night. So there's no, uh, there's no off nights, but it's, you know, it's been fun. It's, you know, like, I think I was telling you in a tech, you're just playing every game, like every day you feel like you're playing. So it's just like, it's fun. You're just going to going to the rank and playing games. Keith, does this feel like the first time that you and Tampa have actually had a real rivalry? I mean, they've, they've, they're both been in Florida for almost 30 years now, but there's never been a real rivalry, it seems like, till this year with this division set up. Yeah, probably. I mean, I think when we play, we play them always in the beginning of the season. It, it seems like it's always heated because we play them like three or four times in, in training camp. And then we usually start the season with them twice. So it's usually pretty heated the first couple games. And then, you know, you can go a while without seeing them. But with the way it is now, you're seeing them a lot. And, um, yeah, it's definitely a good in-state rival for sure. 
this kid Carter Verhege. I think I was talking to Strang back home, Billy Ryan. It's like Ver Swaggy. Um... Ver Swaggy is his name. <laughs> is that really what it is? Yeah, Ver Swaggy. He is Swagoo. I think that actually needs to forever be his name now. If an announcer it's doesn't call him Ver yeah. Swaggy, Jack Edwards will still fuck it up somehow. But. <laughs> He kind of reminds us of like Jonathan Marshall, so who you know went to Florida and didn't have a ton going on and had battled his way up. Like this kid played in the East Coast Hockey League, he looks mm-hmm. awesome. Is that just? I mean, I'm not saying it's just playing with Barkov, but he must have sides of him. We were like, wow, I can't believe this kid wasn't making a bigger impact in the NHL. Yeah, it's. I mean, he is very, very talented. He flies. I don't know if it you can tell on TV, but he is very, very fast. He's really good with the puck. Obviously, it shows a lot about how deep Tampa is if you know kind of he wasn't playing a regular role every single night and uh it also shows you know the hard work he's put in the guys grinded in the he played in the coast the minors and uh worked his way up to the first line getting to play with Barkov and he uh he's in the like offensive zone he's always around the puck he's really good at like coming to the little things that he does uh during a game that you're like, this guy's special. And he's, he's really good. His, his shot last night was a cannon. He's got a really hard shot. Um, so yeah, he's, he's, he's a, he's a hell of a player for sure. What's different from last year. You guys are kind of firing all on all cylinders right now. I know the season, like you said, only half full, but you just never really got to that point last year. What's the big difference? I don't know. It's, it's tough to really say. I mean, we, I feel like we got a really new group too. So it's not a, yeah, we got, I feel like we've got like, 10, 12 new guys. So it's kind of something where, you know, you come in and it's new faces and no real, you know, you, no one's played together. It's kind of a weird training camp where you, yeah, you're not around everyone too. So it's, it's been one of those things that we've just kind of bonded on the ice and been playing and enjoying ourselves on the ice. But uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell you the difference, but I think, I think we're a lot faster than we were last year. We brought in guys that are, that are faster and we, um, you know, we, the way that the league is too now, you, you got to be fast to win. And, uh, you yeah, know, I think they did a good job of that. Well, pride of, uh, Springfield for Toronto, him straight, straight away speed is like, he's like a, a running back. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's like running a, on the ice. Remember that game, Sonic the Hedgehog? Like you, it, he'd go up the thing Sonic. and see, collect the yeah. coins. The I hedgehog. Used to have, okay. I used to have it. Yeah. The haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what awesome. about, all right. So talk about the road. I mean, you notoriously had never gotten room service before. Still and then this haven't. year, what are you doing? <laughs> Uber eats. Uber eats. Yeah. Uber he eats, eats had... on the curb just cause he refuses to get room. Uber service. Eat... I mean, they have meals first too. So in like the meal room. So I mean, I'm counting that as not room service. I haven't eaten a dinner in my room. Let's just say that. Um, it's, I was, I mentioned yesterday online about uh, underappreciated players. And obviously I mentioned Barkov, but Huberto is another guy who, I mean, mm-hmm. he flies under the radar and this is probably one of the best starts he's ever had as far as the team's concerned. Just like talk about his impact and, you know, maybe the step that he's taken this year, as far as his overall pro, uh, overall play. Yeah. And, and he was a guy too, I think for the majority of his career, I mean, I think he was here before Barky, but he's played a lot of his career with Barkov and obviously put up monster numbers. And, um, but this year he hasn't played with him uh, that much and he's still doing what he can do. I think he's one of the best passers I've ever played with. He can thread a pass through the seam and the power play. He's, he's the guy we want, um, you know, with the puck on his stick, he is insane. But, uh, I think he's proven that, you know, he doesn't just have to play with Barkov. He's making other guys better. He's playing with Hornquist, who I think has 11 goals or something like and that. And the best he's tan playing. in the league right now. Yeah. Oh does my he have a tanning God. bed or is he just hanging out outside all day? No, he's, uh, he, he's got the spray tan. He does yeah, the, the one tan. that doesn't wash off. Yeah, yeah. He, he, got, the, he got the good one that Witt didn't get. <laughs> this guy's he fall, like, he follows the rules after you have one. You wouldn't. You would have a t- like you wouldn't have a shirt on if you were built like him, just absolutely shredded this guy. So you wouldn't have a shirt on. So he, uh, yeah, he he works on the tan and it's nice. Is it is it true? Hold on, Biz. Is, is it true? He said I gotta I gotta get better at golf. And somebody asked him why. He's like, I bought the course back home. 
<laughs> I don't know. I never heard that, but I'm I think Hubie gonna... bought the course back. Oh, Hubie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, true. Yeah. That's true. Yes, yes. That is 100% Oh, sorry. True. I should have specified. I thought we were talking oh, about Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You should have yeah. what? Well, specific specified. Okay, I actually Chris. said, as I said it, what we was had a blame, brain, a blame so transplant. What, 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 is the, what is the actual word? Specified? Specified. specified. Nice. Holy you weren't shit. even fucking close. This is English. Brunelli looks oh. like he's in a gym room closet, like a... Yeah, he's at, he's, at got a deal, he's at Burlington High. He's at Burlington High. Yeah. Oh, in nice. the locker room. During COVID, he got a deal on it. He'd been telling everybody about it. Um, who, who are the absolute clowns on this team? Like, who are the young guys who came in that you guys just, like, torture because they're silly characters? Marchman. And why? Mason Marshman. His name's Mush. Um, <laughs> I think his dad... His, so he's got... he's. Him and his dad are third all time for most penalty minutes as a father son combination. He has two penalty minutes. <laughs> his dad has like seven thousand. It's is insane. It, uh, Brad, his father Brad is savage. No, Brian Marchman. Oh, no, Brian. Brian's his dad. Yeah, yeah. Savage. Yeah. A killer. Yeah. Now this kid, he's he's great. He's just like the one you like. You know, you, you torture young guys. He was getting a massage after the game. He's played like I don't know. I I Three think minutes. it's his for yeah. No, no, he's playing first line. He's playing great, but he's uh, kicking Bark off off the table. Yeah, yeah, no. So I brought Barky in with him. I'm like, Barky, uh, how many massages have you got in your career? And he's like, one. <laughs> and then Marchi, I'm like, Marchi, yeah. that's, that's the best player in the world. He's got one massage. <laughs> and then Marchi's like, ah. Oh. So we put the massage table in his uh, in his stall the next day, just like little stuff like that. But he's he's great. <laughs> Oh, that's the shit I miss, man. That's those yeah, are the, the best that I miss. As far as uh, the videos concerned, who was the most surprising that you ended up seeing? Who ended up giving uh, you know giving you congratulations? The um, most surprised, I don't know. I, I, Buddy I don't and Patty they... off the bat. I was surprised by that yeah. for some reason. Yeah, it makes total sense, but I don't know why. I just thought of players. I guess because Thornton asked me and Biz, so I didn't think of them. I knew Patty was like uh, just. Looking for a cocktail after this. Yeah, patty potty. Exactly. Um, uh, the most, I don't know. I saw, so the the whole thing, they didn't show last night, but someone sent me a video. It's like a seven minute video of all of them. And Rick Nash's was, his was really funny. We had like an inside joke about key lime pie. He mentioned that. So it was, uh, his was, his was good. Yeah, I saw that. I felt so left out that I didn't get it. Yeah. No, so he, this guy likes, Key lime pie. Worst dessert in only the history per, of the world. Only, yes. You might as so well I, have egg salad for lunch and key lime pie for dessert. He eats that. He eats that on the plane. No. Ugh. I swear on our friendship. Egg, so he, if you're egg eating salad. egg salad in my face, who I, have to, I have to be 20 feet away from you. Minimum. So he, we'd go. We, the first time I ever went to dinner, I think we, we might have been in Key West. He's like, I'll have the key lime pie. I'm like, no, we won't. Like, he's not <laughs> having that at this table. I call it burnt sour. It tastes like burnt sour. Like if you ever try it, it's disgusting. And this guy, I don't know if he did it just to like piss me off, but he would get it every time we went to dinner. It wouldn't even eat it. Just order yeah. it to the table so you could stare. I don't at even it. think he like. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, I went to Ocean Forty Four in Scottsdale with a couple buddies, and one guy got it. I I, I haven't talked to him since. I blocked his number. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, like not to go too serious here, but like obviously early on, like you. You know, you got to Arizona, you were probably having a good time off the ice, but like uh, you ended up buttoning it up. And obviously like Donor and a guy like Derek Morris and some other hands helped you like, you know, I guess like kind of carve you out to be a, more of a professional, like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of kind of touch on that. Yeah, no, those guys were, if, you know, I, it, I was so lucky to obviously be drafted anyways, but to be drafted by Phoenix and to be put in, a situation where I got to look up to guys and guys wanted to take care of young guys. And, you know, I went in there, obviously you're 18, 19, 20 years old and, you know, you live in near ASU and you kind of, you can, uh, you can have your fun there. And I think, um, you know, seeing donor and Derek Morris, Ray Whitney, uh, you know, guys that just had been around for a while that knew how to take care of themselves. I was able to go out there and train, um, you know, Phoenix made me go out there to get away from, uh, you know, the, the crew back home a couple summers. So, which was, you know, probably sucked at the time, but, uh, we all know, thrived him. once he left town at that point, biz. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I missed out on some Fagawis and stuff like that, but, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously it, it worked out and it was one of those things where I needed to, you know, 
figure out how to be a pro and, and, and how to handle myself off the ice. And I, I definitely thank those guys, uh, for showing me the right way. And it was, um, you know, save, save my career and save my life. Everyone just, um, has been so complimentary of you and your career and all the good games you've played, but is there any like one game in, in a thousand and three now where you're like, Oh man, I didn't have it that night. Yeah. Is there any? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Is there one that sticks out that you were horseshit? Oh yeah, uh, one like I mean, there's got to be about I mean nine hundred and ninety eight at like one where you just like geez, I'm trying to think. I remember one game we played in. I forget where was Paul Career toy? Was he in uh he in Anaheim, Colorado, or Nashville? Oh, he's in Nashville. He in Nashville. Nashville. It might have been not. Na- yeah, yeah, it was in Nashville. And there was a game that I was out there against him and he was, I just remember him just, and I'm like, they got to stop putting me on the ice when this guy's out here. And just like one time I had the puck behind the net and I came out, I didn't see him in front of the goalie. And he just grabbed the puck and put it in. I'm like, Oh boy, what are we doing here? But he was um, just out thinking you. Yeah. He was just completely in my kitchen. Um, well, yeah. One game where I, Wayno I was out the night before and he fucking had no clue. He didn't even realize that you were out there against him every shift, yeah. just getting eaten alive. Yeah. He's blaming and Jovo. What, Jovo's like, it wasn't even me. Yeah. <laughs> Who was it? Uh, one time we were playing uh, San Jose and I, I tried to make a sauce pass through the middle and Jumbo Joe uh, picked it off, came down, probably got an assist because he's all he does is pass. Um, and Gretzky calls me into the office. He's like, not only should you not be on the ice against Joe Thornton, you shouldn't try to pass it through him. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Thought I was going to the minors, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there was some. There was obviously a lot of tough games. Actually, going way back, wasn't your wasn't the first time you got called up? They just called you up and bagged you, and then sent you back down. You didn't play. Or am I missing? Oh, I had a lot that? of bag. I had a lot of bag skates. Um, With all so, my, my son, right? Yeah, Alfie was a killer. Oh, um, was he thirty? One of those thirty minute guys. I, it was yeah. yeah. It, 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 we used to have no puck practices. <laughs> Yeah. It was I remember insane. having one of those with Terry and that's hell on earth for a guy. Hell like on me. Earth. Yeah. 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 For anyone. I'm like, I have to have contact with people today. Oh no. He called yeah. it the sorority skate, spending too much time at ASU. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. You want to fucking hang out on campus? Okay. All yeah. right. Line up buddy. <laughs> yeah. Get on the line. Yeah. Well, dude, I, I swear as, as a good buddy of yours, I think the press conference after I was like most impressed where you said you thank like you're so thankful every day that you're in the NHL. Like you not only did you make it, but you've made it times 10. It's like just been this this dream career so far. So I was so happy for you and we appreciate you coming on. We don't want to keep you uh, for too long. What's well, like Ray, Ray Whitney said, you know, the little NHL symbol on your uh, jersey. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, anytime you have that on, it's a good day. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's my a friend. fact right there. I love fact, it. Well. Yeah. All right, buddy. We'll keep it going. And uh, the cats, the pesky cats on the on the prowl in South Florida. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. No song. No song. Yeah. No song. Care, pal. Congrats on All a right. thousand, brother. Thank you, guys. Thanks for everything. Big thanks to our buddy Keith for jumping on with us. Congrats again. A thousand games. He's going to keep on chugging. Wait, how many years do you think he got left? I mean, he's still got fucking good legs. Three, four as easily. As he five wants. He's like uh, TB12. It just keeps going and going. Yeah. I, I, I also will say, like, uh, so right now he's third in all times uh, games played in a row behind Gary Unger and Doug Jarvis. Check out Gary Unger's numbers. I, I mean, I know it's a different era, but what a career that guy had. I didn't know really anything about him until I looked into it once uh, seeing the ceremony and, and doing, you know, a little research for the show, guys. You know I'm a professional. So congrats to Keith. It's awesome. And uh, we appreciate him coming on. What else you got for us, Rear Admiral? Well, you've heard us talk about Whoop. It truly is our favorite fitness wearable. It's the fitness tracker that provides 24-7 personalized sleep, training, and recovery insights to help you unlock your potential. Each day, it measures how well you slept, how recovered you are, and how much stress you put on your body from both your workouts and going about your everyday life. Whoop is worn by some of your favorite athletes in the NHL and on the PGA Tour, but it's not meant for just professional athletes, as evidenced by me and Grinelli using them. Whoop can help anyone improve their performance by providing personalized, actionable data to help you make smarter decisions. The Chicklets boys have been wearing our whoops for a while now, and we've already turned our sleep and recovery into a competition 
I roll with the sleep every week. Once you're on Whoop, you can create a team with your buddies and make sure you chirp whoever's sitting around and falling behind. Whoop has helped me get smarter about the way I sleep and has made me so much more aware of my body's recovery and the way I train when I do train. And right now, Whoop is offering 15% off when you use the code CHICKLETS at checkout. So go to whoop.com. That's W-H-O-O-P.com to join now. Sleep better, recover faster, and train smarter this year and beyond with Whoop. Once again, that code is CHICKLETS, C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S. All right, boys, keeping with that 1,000 games played theme, Patrick Kane uh, reached the accomplishment as well. Last week, played in his 1,000th game. He's the seventh Hawk to skate in 1,000 games in the Chicago uniform and the youngest to do it. Um, we've talked about it before. as another guy who just keeps getting it done with. I mean, is, is he already the best American player? I know you said he has. Is anything ever going to change your mind? I doubt it will. Maybe Austin Matthews. Ooh. But I, I, I think that Kane is just like such a joy to watch. I, it's very hard to repeat yourself over and over with him because it's just superlative after superlative, and you just can't say enough. But the, game, the guy's game is just at another level mentally more than anything. He just, outthink, he just outthinks everyone. And I know it's the skill, and like that's what jumps off the page. And it's like the, the wow factor of his hands in tight, the shootout moves, the big-time goal scoring, like the clutch goal scoring, the hat trick he had against L.A., all these memories. But it all stems back to his brain and how he thinks the game because he knows where all the space is. He knows how to create time for himself. And he's just mastered the ability of not getting hit. It's just that's not like something that, that's, a, that's a true like skill with your mind and your brain to be able to just think the game at, a, at another level. Yeah. So congrats. His hunger and, and skill level and, and the way he plays, like no surprise if he gets to 1,500 and, and, and shatters uh, s- some records at least. He, yeah, I mean, I think he's also a guy, and we just talked about Keith, and he said, you know, seeing some veterans and realizing what it takes. I mean, Kane, you know, it, there was public kind of certain issues off the ice where he was definitely partying a little bit, and no doubt about it in the last whatever it's been 10, 12 years, yeah. he has changed his life to be dedicated solely and towards the game of hockey. And and he cares so much. And when you say the drive and the hunger, it is true because he changed his entire life around realizing like what he had and how much he loved it. Well said, buddy. Well said. Uh, Tampa Bay, as expected, Nikita Kucherov is on track to return for the playoffs. Uh, that news popped out this week. But I sent you guys that article. It was in The Athletic about John Cooper uh, and how his career started. We had mentioned it before, but this this article got into the, that first year he coached kids in high school. Didn't really get into much after. Just a great story, man, how he basically took the job almost as a favor, and it ended up being his career where he reached the pinnacle like t- 10 years later. Just an absolutely incredible read, huh, Biz? Yeah, sometimes the, the best things in life start organically, and it's it's obvious that it sparked his passion for the game, and he, he's been on this incredible wild ride and and found himself in, in inside a, a situation where this this is probably going to be a dynasty. Yeah, I mean, Tampa's been doing it for quite a while now. But, uh, boys, the real story out of this division this week, Carolina Hurricanes, they've won eight games in a row, 41 points, good for second in the league. I mean, fucking Aho has been getting it done. But, dude, Vinny Trocek, man, after the trade last year, he struggled to adapt a little bit to Carolina. He's been an absolute stud for them this year so far. 13 goals, 11 assists in 24 games at a point-per-game pace. Uh, Jordan Stahl's having a monster year. I'll tell you, James Reimer, I mean, he held that fourth down. Peter Mrazek was out here for a while. Reimer won some big games for them. Uh, we got to give them their props right now, Wits. Yeah, they're nasty. And maybe I uh... – was a little off on some preseason predictions, but this was the one team I said they could surprise win this division because they are nasty. And Brendan Moore's such a good coach. And it's funny you bring up Jordan Stahl, like getting the chance to see him up close. You know, he's, I, I played him in what, when he was 18, 19. Um, you could tell he would play f- for this long, like his body and the way he played the game. He's just a man at such, such a young age. And just to see him like grow into himself as a player where – you know, he was a very high pick and he's not he's not an 80 point guy, but he's very like well aware and what he does well. And that is like basically what Rod Brindamore did well. Like, do they not kind of remind you of each other? Maybe it's crazy. And Brindamore, I, I don't I'm not saying exactly playing styles, but I'm saying like they make a difference on the game not always on the score sheet, right? And, and I think Jordan Stahl is like the perfect example. And I saw a rumor or was reading stuff online about possible trades, like maybe Eric Stahl back to Carolina to play with his brother there. So I, I think this team is, um, who knows if that could even happen, but 
This team is fun to watch. And Trocek, when I was in San Antonio, I've said it a bunch of times. He was down there. He had no business in the minors. Like this kid right off the bat, I was like, what is this kid doing? But Florida, that's when like, you know, I couldn't make the team and the team stunk. So I think that like he finally was given a chance, dominated. And then that injury he had was bad, man. It was like, yeah. I remember actually, I remember actually seeing Keith like, visually like rattled and upset after after the way he went down and the pain he was in getting off the ice on a stretcher where his ankles just mangled so he's feeling good and it's just a fun it's a hard team to play against and a fun team to watch and i actually love when they rock the whalers unis like people chirping for that those whalers unis are sick who cares if they're not in hartford i will say they have made some some tremendous trades i mean the trocheck one was a bit of a head scratcher for me to, for, for, as far as florida maybe giving up on him a little bit early but you said you mentioned that injury and you know when he came back he definitely wasn't himself he seemed like he'd lost a step but they clearly to me gave up on him a little bit early but he's went there and had a you know a, a, a great uh, a great campaign so far with the carolina hurricanes but i just feel like that whole their whole team dynamic, they just all play together. They all pull the rope in the same way. And, and, and it stems from that great leadership and, and Rob Brindamore and the, and the way they're coached. Another, another great trade that I, I was surprised at is when they got Dougie Hamilton. I mean, just like another guy in the back end who consistently puts up great offensive numbers, great shot, um, you know, very underrated. But uh, just a lot of guys who have went there and really established their careers. Yeah, I think Dougie's uh, unrestricted after this year too, if I'm not mistaken. I could double check that in a second. He is. He's. I think he's the one defenseman that's available. I was looking at unrestricted free agents this off season. There are not many. There are not many good unrestricted free agents coming up. So I would imagine he signs a pretty nice. That's ticket. very good for some people, you know, because it's not about how good you are. It's about who else is available when it comes to UFA. Remember that, youngins, when you're going coming up on your UFA year. Yeah. Need a dance partner. Uh, another week in the Central Division biz. Uh, another week of torts and line A drama. I mean, this is kind of getting a little. I'm monotonous. over it. It's it's uh, getting old. It's getting I'm old. Yeah. Uh, just play the get, quotes. Play yeah, the get, quotes. Play just the to get quotes. the listeners up to speed for us, the team blew a four-one third period lead to Florida the other night. Uh, line A and Roslovich were on the bench for the last six fifty-three of the game. Roslovich did get no T. Line A didn't. Uh, here's what Torts had to say about it. Yeah, uh, you know. You guys, you guys call it a benching and 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 all that. I, I my job is to uh, throughout hockey games make decisions on who's going, who isn't, uh, situational play, uh, momentums of games, uh, what the other team's putting out there. There's a lot of things coming to play, uh, especially when we're uh, we're reeling a little bit there. Um, so yeah, I, I make decisions on on players ice times and where I put them all the time. And is it a benching? No, I, I didn't bench anybody last night. I just decided to play some other people in situations uh, late in the third period that I felt more comfortable with at that time. And uh, th- those are the calls I have to make as, as uh, running the bench. So I know all the drama starts with the benchings and this and that. I, I don't get it. It's just, it's just my decisions as far as who I think is going to give us the best chance in those minutes. You guys think I want don't want to play Patty? I, mean, I want to play him. Uh, but I still have to make calls as far as how the players are, are playing at that particular time. I'll go a little deeper for you just to try to explain it so you understand it. I thought Patty probably played one of his best periods in the first period. He, he, he played really well. But I also have to make calls as the rest of his game is going on where he is at that particular time, especially late in the third period uh, and, and us reeling a little bit. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not – I'd love to be able to put all my top guns out there. But they, they – I also have to look at how they're playing at that particular time too. And so I, I hope that explains it for you. There's – there's no free passes because you're you're notably the top gun. The, the, I don't look at it that way. I, I look at what's happening right now, uh, as far as in those minutes of the hockey game, and uh, and and go that way. And if I make mistakes, absolutely. Uh, but I'm certainly going to go with my stomach as far as what I feel is best at that particular time for the hockey club. 
is he like messing with everyone? Is he like trying to fuck with everyone? Like, what do you mean you didn't bench him? You didn't play him. What is, what is, I understand that you're saying he doesn't give you the best chance to win, but how can you not consider that benching? It's like, I, I think he was messing with everyone to try to think like, what will they say? Because I'm, I'm saying I'm completely contradicting myself. Or am I wrong here, Biz? I don't know. You look like so confused and like, were you listening no, to me? No, I'm just like, I don't want to be too critical because like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't know the guy, but I just, I'm just kind of like, if, if I had a coach who was always the center of attention, it would drive me absolutely fucking mad. It would drive me mad. And I feel like that that's how it is there. And, and maybe blame it on the media as far yeah, as like, he'd, every, he'd say he's not doing anything, I guess. Yeah. Just answering the, and, and they're teeing him up and maybe, maybe he's frustrated. I don't know. I just feel like it's like every week there's something going on between torts and one of his fucking players. It's like every fucking week. No. And line, line, the best ball. He's like, line, I, didn't line I, was goes, I thought I was playing good. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I, I think the problem was is it, one of the, said one it was of, the best first period he's ever had. He was the first period was the best period I've ever seen him play. And then he, uh-huh. and then he, I think he he was he made a mistake on the like the second goal that kind of snowballed their their yeah, comeback for, for two of them. But it's like holy fuck! I mean, if, if the guy plays twenty minutes a night, I mean, mistakes are going to happen, right? So I don't know. It's yeah. uh, it's a it's a fucking gong show. It's it's never ending. Columbus but disappointing uh, season. Duh. A lot of expectations there. I mean, uh, shouldn't, you shouldn't say a lot. Shouldn't say a lot. That I misspoke, but definitely on what they've done, even after losing key guys and bouncing back, it was more more was expected than we've we've seen and been given. I did watch them play against Dallas the other game, where it ended up going to overtime, and uh, I, I can't remember who exactly who got the overtime winner. Maybe it was Wierenski. For, for the Blue Jackets, but uh, great, solid game. I thought both teams were good. And Dallas is another team that I, w- I was tweeting about. I thought that they got kind of hosed a little bit early, as did a few other teams because of the lockdown and how they weren't able to play many games and get in a rhythm. And all of a sudden, now they're going to be log jammed in the in the back part. And they've dealt with some injuries. Sagan hasn't been in the lineup. I think R- Rupe Hintz has, has, has been out. And, and they haven't been able to find their rhythm. But those are two teams who, I mean, they're on the outside looking in. And I know that Dallas does have some games in hand, but uh, I picked Columbus and Dallas to, to make playoffs, and it's, it's not looking good. Dallas is shocking. Dallas is like, oh, my God, what is going on there? I thought they, they were going to be nice. They, it's, it's unfortunate because Bishop can't stay healthy. When he's healthy, his numbers are incredible. He's been a Vesna finalist for three times. I mean, they're, they're goaltending. I, I think um, – Help me out here with his name. Ottinger. Ottinger, right? Jake. You say it? Yeah, not Hudobin. Hudobin's bright. Hudobin's number one. Now Ottinger's backing him up. Yeah. BU, so, former BU Terror. Uh, yeah, their, their numbers have kind of leveled off. And, and I mean, they're, they seem to be always in every game, but they just can't, haven't been able to find the wins. And uh, although they did get one, uh, one today on, on Sunday, so hopefully they can get things going and figure things out. Cause the last time I believe a team went to the finals and didn't make playoffs was after uh, the LA Kings won the cup in 2014. And then the next year they didn't make playoffs. Huh? No well, biz pulling. That was the last out. time. Stack guy. It's that guy. That one other note. One other note from the division, Nashville's Dante Fabro was uh, given a two-game suspension for elbow in Carolina's Brock McGinn uh, earlier in the week. Keep um, your elbows down, Dante. Come on, Dante. Uh, oh, we didn't even mention our second guest. We're not bringing him on quite yet, but uh, Brent Sutter uh, won a Stanley Cup with the early 80s Islanders, played in the league for a bunch of fucking oh, 20 I years. I think he won two, so, he won two cups, I believe. He won two cups, yep. He, uh, then he coached in the, in the league for five years. Then he returned to Red Deer uh, to take on the local junior squad. We're going to get to him shortly. But first, his brother, Daryl, just took over the Calgary Flames, and he busted out the bag skate right away. No surprise there. Uh, I think Jeff Wood might have been a little too much of a player's coach for him, but Daryl, Daryl Sutter, what should we expect uh, out of Carolina biz going forward? Calgary. Uh, Calgary. Cal- what I said, I'm sorry, Cal. Yeah, that's staying in. That's Calgary. Yeah. Calgary is two and zero since he took over behind the bench. And biz, I know that you've talked a lot before about what LA guys said about him, and we discussed when his hiring last episode. But in reading and like seeing what's going on there definitely seems to be a different vibe around the team. Like Tanev said they had the best practice they'd had all season, the first practice that he was on the ice. And people said he bag skated him. They, they, everyone did three up and backs, I think it was, or up, back, and then there again. Like it was not a bag skate. It was for three minutes. And guys said they loved it, 40 minutes. Daryl Sutter is going to make that team more accountable. That's just no doubt. Like he, he will, he will, 
I'm not going to say scare guys, but he'll make you make you aware that you just won't play and that it's not acceptable. And I'm not saying that the the guy that was there before, um, excuse me, I can't remember Jeff Ward, Jeff right? Ward. I'm not saying that he wasn't doing that, but it's just a different vibe coming from a guy who's been around this league. And wait till you hear his brother's interview, guys. It's one of the funnest. I don't know if that's a word. Most fun interviews we've ever done. Stories galore, but you yeah. can tell growing up a Sutter is like yeah, it's you, there's no bullshit, right? And so I think that Calgary in beating Montreal two in a row, that's that's hope for them. Um, they're battling four or five right now with Montreal. You'd have to think that will be the five teams battling for the four spots, right? If Toronto and Winnipeg are in and then you see Edmonton looking real good and then also you have to imagine Vancouver's not that far out right now, which has been surprising because they started off so poorly, but Calgary is now alive, and I think that you're going to see a different team moving forward in these next couple weeks. Yeah, just from what I've been reading, it's uh, they're playing with a little bit more pace and speed, and they're supporting the puck better. That's that's. I mean, I'm try- trying to siphon as much information online. I think people were a little bit hyperbolic about the fact that they started out pra- practice nice with nice word. That's my that's my go to. Um, oh, yeah. shout out to um, Lucic and Josh Anderson. It was kind of Anderson who stepped to him. Ooh. And that's like, in my mind, that was like a little out of his weight class, but that shows a lot of balls. That was a good fight. That was and a he, great scrap. Great scrap. And Luch still has it, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean, trying to get Montreal going, that was uh, that was a good one to watch. So I, I had this written down in my notes. I think, I, I know because of the division situation, I think fighting's making a comeback. I think that uh, I think that the that the the, the that the concussion talk and the consequences and, and and yada yada yada. I think that that kind of deterred a little bit. I think teams are starting to see that there's value in adding more and yeah. more toughness. No, are the numbers yeah. up? Yeah, they are. I, I don't have them right in front of me, but I know they they're definitely up this this season. There's way more fights now. There was one night the other night they do a four awesome. separate fights in in different games and. Yeah, it's good to have that passion. The back. passion and, fights, exactly. All right. Well, and, the, and out of the passion fights. I'm kind of hopping over uh, divisions here, but um, San Jose adding this Curtis Gabriel. I mean, he's oh, not. Geez. He's not. He's not playing any tummy sticks. He's gaining a lot of en- enemies quick, right off the hop, fighting Revo. Um, then I don't know if you guys saw this. Him and um, him and Kyle Clifford were chirping at each other in warm up one game. I'd be interested to hear what that conversation was like because you don't oftentimes see Clifford going out of his way in warm up. And it to, was for it was for like fifteen minutes. They were oh, it was the were, whole warm up. And then sure that that was another great scrap. Yeah, that and was. Then, uh, and then and I believe the next game uh, against Anaheim, he ended up going to Laurier. So he's uh, he's out to make a name for himself, and and you could definitely see that the the fighting is on the rise. And I'm curious to know if that this they're going to be able to sustain it once the the divisions are back to being realigned and 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 people are playing out of division if if it continues. A source told me they were talking about the Takashi Six Nine documentary as before the game. <laughs> Listen, I, I've to, I've made it very clear that I'm invested into the rap game. I, I'm not I'm not a supporter of Takashi Six Nine, but folks. Go check out this documentary on this kid on Hulu. Why are you why, giggling? What, what, that, right? what is no, it? Why is Ari laughing? No, I just think it's hilarious that, that, that Biz has like the thing for Takashi. I don't know. We talk about it a bunch. And I, I did. I watched the and doc. Brittany, and, asked, and Brittany, he says like tweet at him, free Brittany. Well, the Brittany thing I, I kind of get because you see the circumstances. But that, I watched that Takashi 6 9 doc too. And I, yeah, I, I don't know. I just... I. I all I hear about is his music, but it just seems like he's more of like a, a troll than anything than a, than an actual musician. And and people take the bait. And even at the end of the doc, well, I'm not really a spoiler, alert, but the director's like, "Did I just take his bait too?" And it's like, "Yeah, you just fucking gave him a two hour movie." That, Why that are you so did. like amazed by this guy, Biz? Well, I, I just think that the come up's amazing, and the fact that there 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 became this whole SoundCloud rap game where these kids didn't really necessarily need they didn't need as much of the industry in order to make them famous to where they kind of found their own outlet. And, and there was all this, listen, the, the music, most of the SoundCloud music coming it's out. So I mean, bad. It's terrible. It's terrible. But I just found, found it fascinating. I think that to Takesha six, nine, I'll even tell you, he's like, I don't make good music, but I make fucking wild videos. And, and his come up just took on a mind of its own. And, and the fact that he got in, invested with these gangs and they, and he kind of like used it as his come up. And it's, it's just a fascinating documentary. And, and, and this, this kid is just, he, he, he wanted to be famous and he found a way to get famous. And, and if you have any interest in, in, uh, in like chaotic energy, I would recommend you guys check it out. I'd rather go to 
Disney Springs build a T-Rex lunch 365 <laughs> days a year than listen to Takashi 6, 617. Fair enough. But- I would never, like, I heard one of his songs once. I almost threw up. So, R.A., back in your era, and not to, like, throw a, a jab that you're a little bit older, but... It- can you can you think of even anyone similar um, in, in the music industry that kind of used that uh, not not just the trolling but the shock value in order to gain steam and eventually propelled their career to to a high level? Well, not really because the the internet is such a huge factor here. Like before, you had to have somebody cover you. Now with the internet, you can just put something out there and people will discover it. So, no, this is kind of all new to to have somebody you know get their name out there by just bas- basically fucking around the internet. I mean, I would say going back just since music started, some people have always done kind of PR stunts, but nothing along these lines that I can recall. Uh, I mean, maybe in other genres of music, I haven't really paid attention to. Not liking the music at all. Did you did you find it fascinating how it how it I mean, how, it, how it all came to be? Yeah, from a neutral perspective, like you know, you know this guy's a, a fascinating life, uh, a roller coaster, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it was definitely interesting from that perspective. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't like say it was like the best documentary I saw. He just, he basically just does this, all this weird shit and trolls everyone and takes the bait. I'm just surprised. All he's right, still you're alive, basically but- telling, you're basically telling Biz that it's be like somebody telling you they hated Ted Lasso. It's kind of <laughs> fucked up. No, I, I, hey, listen, I could get why somebody would hate that documentary. I just found it very, very fascinating. Yeah, no, I didn't hate it. I just, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm not as enamored with the guy as his other people and. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a character of some sort. I'm just surprised he's still alive to testify yeah. against fucking gang members like that and point fingers and, and be a snitch, and, and they ain't got him yet, and he's still fucking out in public. So I don't know if he's got Now some... he's picking fights with Meek Mill. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that concludes that's the rap portion boy. of the uh Yeah, that's it. that's it about the SoundCloud rappers. Then now, now let's go to Brent Sutter. He's probably, like, leading to this, listen to this intro. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> All right. Actually, before we get to Brent Sutter, uh, hey, guys, we want to get serious for one second. The last time, the last year has been pretty hot on a lot of people, and that's why we're doing something new, and we're pot- partnering with our new sponsor, BetterHelp Online Therapy. A lot of us take care of our bodies, but with as tough of a year as it's been on a lot of people, we might also want to think more about taking care of our minds. A lot of people battle with their temper or their stress is about to kill them, or they have depression, anxiety, PTSD. The list goes on. If this is you, you can use therapy to get some tools that make life easier. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really all about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash chicklets. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash chicklets. C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S. And R.A., you know, so many people will at times like feel bad or feel embarrassed about not feeling great about themselves. And that's just should never be the case because everyone goes through it. And I think people who do get the chance to talk to somebody realize how much it can help. So check that out for sure. Well said, Whit. And now we're going to send it over to Brent Sutter. You're going to love this one. Well, I'd like to welcome our next guest to the show. He played over 18 NHL seasons with the Islanders and Blackhawks, winning two Stanley Cups on Long Island back in the 80s. He's won two World Junior Gold Medals coaching Team Canada and a Memorial Cup. He also spent five years coaching the Devils and Flames before returning to Alberta, where he currently serves as president, general manager, and head coach of the Red Deer Rebels of the Western Hockey League. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Brent Sutter, how are we doing, my friend? Hey, doing Awesome. What an intro, Jesus! What is what has this guy not done? He drives the bus. You drive the bus. Too, you make the you? lunches for the team. <laughs> I, I yeah, I change the oil in the engine in the bus. Yeah, <laughs> make it look mean. Unbelievable. Yeah. How so? How's the arena life treat, treating the team? Are you are you sleeping at the arena as well, like everybody else? Nope. <laughs> hey, God no. No one, no one, the president. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, what we do though is uh, we do have. Uh, two suites uh, for staff. So there's two staff that uh, uh, rotate in and out and stay with the kids in the suites. Uh, so we always make sure there's somebody always here. Um, 
the guy, the people like someone like myself, I, I fall under the protocols, the same protocols if some with other teams are doing where they just kids would just be at their billets. So I'm allowed to be at the rink and uh, and basically back at the farm. Um, so they can't go anywhere else. How have the players been adapted to it? Is it something they got quickly used to? You know what? The, the players have been awesome. Um, you know, it was at the end of the day, this was this was really their choice. Uh, we gave them three options, uh, stay at the billets, uh, stay in a hotel, or be here. And with the protocols that are in place, we had, uh, if you're at the billets, you can only be at the rink or at the billets house. Or if it was a hotel, you can be here at the hotel. Well, the kids can't see each other once they leave the rink. Yeah. So this was, uh, I just thought from an organizational standpoint, my son, Merrick, and my, uh, who's my senior VP, and my nephew, Sean, who's my assistant GM, we just all thought the right thing to do would be for the players to be here, but let's let them have that choice. So we talked to them, and it was pretty unanimous across the board. They all wanted to be at the rink so they could be hanging out with each other and doing things when, uh, when we're not practicing or working out. So, and there's a lot, we got a lot for them to do here. There's, they got uh, basketball hoops, uh, ping, the ping pong things became the, the real key thing here. They got tournaments going and stuff like that going on. On We got this all set up on the concourse and basketball hoops. And we basically moved the, the bikes and everything from the weight room upstairs on the concourse, uh, just because of social distancing and um, they got card games going. Uh, of course they got their, all their video stuff going and stuff that they do that they do on their phones, but they have TVs everywhere. There's basically living rooms set up in different areas of the rink where there's couches and the meals are unbelievable. Uh, we got uh, catering service here right at the rink. That's uh, been service. They've been uh, serving the kids all their meals. Uh, They've been treated extremely good. So, you know, I wouldn't want it any other way. Well, you've certainly turned Red Deer into just such a powerhouse program in the WHL. And it's pretty cool that, you know, you got to play in Red Deer and then now you're coaching. And I I, kind of want to go back to your whole family, though, and that's hockey royalty. And for people who don't don't know, six Sutter brothers played in the NHL, six Stanley Cups, over 5,000 games played. There was actually a a seventh brother, Gary, who I'm reading all you guys say was the best player, but he didn't play. Was there... uh, was there stories to go along with him staying back on the farm with, with what I'm reading and, and kind of taking over business there? Well, Gary was uh, Gary could play any position except goal. I mean, he could play forward, defense. Uh, Gary was a very uh, intense, high-strung player. <laughs> um, he, uh, yeah, he he gets suspended off and on for spearing guys and for doing stuff like that back in the day, and uh, he was. Uh, he was a tough, tough player when he played, and yet when he was uh, 16 years of age, he, him and brother Brian had an opportunity to go to Red Deer um, and play junior A with the wrestlers, and Gary chose not to. Um, he had a girlfriend back home that uh, he decided, and she came from a, diff, uh, a tough family, and uh, Gary stayed home to do it to help her through that and chose not to pursue a hockey career at that time. And Brian went and, uh, and that's really it in a nutshell. And yeah. Gary stayed home and he, that's what he, he was stayed back at Viking and he got married. And unfortunately a year, year and a half later after he married her, uh, they went through a divorce. So, yeah. Ah. Uh. Um, I was going to ask, was there like growing up, like, did your father play? Like, what, you know, I mean, being from Viking, of course, that's one of the only things to do playing out in the ponds because it's so cold. But, uh, you know, like, did you feel like there was like a pressure or anything? No, not at all. Dad didn't play at all. Dad, uh, oh, dad played. He played with his, with his work boots on in the sloughs and <laughs> he had to puck all, all the time because uh, if we ever went near him, he'd spear us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we never he, he got to play at the puck the whole time you know, when we played on the sloughs if he played with us so um, no dad never played there was never any pressure from dad at all it was just something you know what a small town everybody all the kids played hockey um, you know there's seven boys you know we had the sloughs on the farm that we'd go scrape off and play we'd play until it was a full moon you'd play all night long um, and then during the summer we We'd throw all the bales out of the hayloft, and we'd play up in the hayloft in the barn. 
so we had a big barn and you know, we just kept going neighbor kids or friends would come over and we'd have tournaments we'd do whatever so um yeah it was like hockey was not just a you know a six month game for us we played we played year round just did it in different ways you guys must have been beating the fucking wheels off oh each other God. in this fucking barn i can only imagine <laughs> that the scraps that were going on well you know what it would get pretty pretty intense sometimes and then you just hear the steps coming up uh or <laughs> the, the boots <laughs> uh, coming up the uh, steps uh people dad walking up the steps you could hear his footsteps coming up and it was like okay we all better stop right now and uh because dad would come up and beat the shit out of all of us so uh, that's just the way it was isn't isn't there a story uh when you guys ended up getting to junior where he was heading into a game and then there was cops there or something like that somebody teed me up for uh, one okay uh yeah it was the year that actually our team won canada that year we were playing in st albert and it was a pretty intense uh rival between st albert and and red deer and uh we had a really good team that year. We built our team to win Canada, and uh, I mean, our our smallest defenseman at that time was five foot ten, two hundred and ten <laughs> pounds. So, brother Ronnie, Rich, Richie, and I we were scrubs on that team, even though like we were pretty good players. And I got drafted that. That was the team I got drafted from in the first round that year. Was uh, by the Islanders was from Red Deer with that playing on that team. But um, what happened was we went into St. Albert. And it's always was an intense rival between the two teams and it was always brawls, right? And brawls back in the day wasn't two fights or it was a full bench clearing brawl, right? And the bench is emptied. Well, it didn't even get a chance for that to even happen. We, we, uh, we went to the rink, got dressed, left our gloves in the dressing room and they did the same thing, and we just went out in the ice and teed off. <laughs> and, uh, and so, I, and of course, there wasn't many fans in the building. The time it was during warm up, <laughs> and uh, no one brought their sticks. So we ever just went out and we started fighting, and uh, it was crazy. And uh, <laughs> it ended up in the penalty box, up in the stands. Uh, there was there was the general managers end up fighting in the in the in the, in the foyer. Uh, our coach, John Chapman, at the time, he had got suspended 12 games from the game before because he chased the ref around the ice in Sherrod Park after a game. So he ended up not coming there with us. So our general manager, Graham Parsons, um, he he hit underneath the bench. <laughs> he went out there. And, of course, Mark Messier's dad, Doug, is a tough cookie, and Doug is their coach. And... Uh, um, this was a real. It was a shit show. It was. Uh, it would end up. It ended up in the concourse. Uh, they eventually turned the lights off, and uh, uh, police came. They shut the lights off, and of course, mom and dad are driving up to the game, and it's an you know it's an hour and just over an hour, an hour and a half drive to get up to St. Albert from Viking, and uh, <laughs> and they pull in the parking lot. Well, when we walked off the ice, the police just basically told us, "Grab your stuff, get your skates off." grab your stuff and get on the bus and get out of town. <laughs> so we were walking on the bus and mom and dad pulled up in the dra- into the parking lot and we got all our equipment and our, you know, you got your sticks and bags and you're throwing them underneath the bus and you're walking on the bus and uh, we're still dressed up and dad just walks up and just goes, you asshole. And t- and turn around and laugh. That was it. You had to that chip was, in for gas you know, money for mom and dad. Know, and you know, the next morning, <laughs> Brother Daryl was playing in the American Hockey League. He just came back from Japan, and he played in Japan that, that year, and he came back, and he was playing in Monk, for the Moncton Hawks, and that was the Blackhawks farm team. And it was a, we played there on, a, on a, a Wednesday night. I had gotten a phone call the next morning by Daryl at 6 o'clock in the morning, which was 9.30, whatever, 9 o'clock Moncton time in the morning, and he's like, Holy shit, what the hell happened? This had already spread across Canada. <laughs> Before the internet. That, yeah, and well, yeah, no, there was no internet then. It was just all over the friggin', it was just all over the media. Like the news, everybody had it. And uh, they called that Black Wednesday. That night was that night, that game to this day it's still called the Black Wednesday, uh, from that brawl. Yeah, so it was so- it was 
it was unbelievable. It was crazy. So, like, going to that game, you guys probably know this is going to happen. Would would you guys get nervous about this thing, or were you just like, yeah, can't wait to get there and throw no, down? No, Biz, he's like, I'm from Viking, Alberta. Here we go. <laughs> well, it goes back from two years before that. Um, actually, Brother Dwayne and I were on the team then, on the same team, and I was only 15. And we played – St. Albert had a hell of a team that year, too. Mark was on that team, Messier. And – uh and they had an older team. Mark was a younger player on that team. Um, I believe Mark was, well, Mark would have been 16. He was a year older than I was. So he would have been a 16 year old. I was a 15 year old. Uh, but they had a lot of 20 year olds come back from major junior hockey, like big guys, like big, big men, right? Like they were big guys. I thought anyway, 15. And, uh, and we played them in the first round of playoffs and and mark's dad doug was coaching so he was an awesome coach and doug's a great man too um uh, but he was a really good coach and yet he was tough right and and our and our coach john chapman was was a tough coach too like great right? and they and anyway we we got in this and it was kind of rival all winter all season long there was a couple brawls through the regular season and then in playoffs we played them and out of the first seven games, we brawled four times in warm up. <laughs> and then game seven, they beat us four three in game seven, and that was a full fledged brawl before the game. Like, it was crazy. Game seven and, uh, brawls. <laughs> well, back in the day, you know, in warm up, you'd skate around, everyone, both teams skate around the full rink of the ice. Oh my right? God. And that's what, and that's what happened is brother Dwayne two handed one of their players skating around and it started the whole thing in game seven. <laughs> well, then we get beat four three. So we think we're done. Right. So we get on the bus, we come back home and we had a 20 year old on our team that was married and had, had just built a house here. And his name was Morley Scott. And so we all went to his place. Well, we partied there for two straight days. No one even went to school. We just partied for two straight days. Well, on the second day at noon, we get a call from Chaffee, our coach, saying, we won the protest. We're going to a game eight. We're like, what? <laughs> and <laughs> we said, you protested the game? He said, yeah, because we only had 20 guys go out, or 19 guys go out. Back then, that was the rosters. They had 19 plus three more came out of the dressing room. So they had 22 guys and we had 19. And so we had won the protest from the league. So we had to go back the next night and play game eight. Was there a brawl that game too? No, they made us warm up separately. <laughs> <laughs> and they made us warm up separately. Well, it was, it was crazy. They, we got beaten overtime. Like oh. I can't believe we, we had, we had 19 guys playing so hungover and, oh. and going in there. And uh, it was score was four two, and I scored late in the game. Or score was three three two, and I scored late in the game to tie it up three three. And I don't know if my teammates were pissed at me or not because I scored because then we had to go in overtime. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, we go in overtime and they beat us four three in overtime, and uh, that and so that carried on. And so the next year, okay, I'm a 16 year old, and we have a completely different coach manager comes in. And he doesn't even recognize what this robbery is like. So we go into Edmonton or go to St. Albert to play an exhibition game. And this other 15 year old that played, in, played on the team the same year I did, Darren McKay, he comes to us before that day and says, you guys aren't going to dress tonight. Because he had brought all these skilled guys and like small little skilled guys in from Saskatchewan and guys that he had, because he was from Saskatchewan, stuff, had no idea what this rivalry was like. And Darren and I were like, yes, we don't have to play this, but we know what's going to happen. So we go sitting in the stands and we're like, okay, we look at our watches and we're like, okay, we're out warming up, like being all these skilled little guys coming out. St. Albert comes out, come out right out in the ice. They shoot the pucks all in our net, in our net, from their end, and then come down in our end to get the pucks. Well, of course, what's going to happen, right? Well, our players were like, holy shit, because Darren and I were the only two players that came back from the year before. And these guys were like, and they just started teeing off on everybody. And it was a full-fledged brawl. Darren and I just sat in the stands and watched it because we couldn't do anything about it, right? And 
So then it carried on, right? And then the next year, they had a big older team. We had an older team. We, they brought Chappie back. Brother Brian was actually partners of buying the team. They bought the team that, that uh, summer. And they went out and recruited hard and built ourselves a phenomenal team and a uh, big team. And, um, yeah, then this this all this stuff happened that year. It led into that big brawl and uh, uh, what's they called Black Wednesday. <laughs> Brent, uh, and dur- you know what's... Scary about that, Doug's dad, Mark, or Mark's dad, Doug, he got suspended for life from that game. No way. Wow. Why? Coach. What did they blame him for most of it then? Well, I think it was just, I guess. Chasing your coach out of the bench? Well, you got to GM. Well, no, but yeah. Doug, Doug and, our, and our trainer, Terry Sexsmith, went toe-to-toe at center ice. <laughs> this and is so Terry, cool. Terry, who was our trainer, he, his name, hook name, his nickname was uh, Hook. Well, Terry played in the East Coast League in the Central Hockey League and got suspended for life down there from kicking a guy in the head. And he was our trainer. So he was a very intense. Like, if we had to get our skates sharpened between periods, you had to almost go out and try to find a way, like, to sharpen yourself because you wouldn't ask Terry to sharpen your skates for you. He'd take your skate and turn around and just throw them at you. <laughs> <laughs> so no one got their skate sharp between periods, right? Oh so, my god! Oh, but Matt. that was uh, that was the makeup of of our team, and there was some heavy suspensions. Like our our general manager got suspended for uh, a year, uh, uh, something like that. But yeah, Mark's dad, uh, you know, got that, and I I kind of I felt bad for Doug because Doug is a was a really good coach, and he was like all coaches back then; they were very intense and. He, he built tough teams. I respected that all the time. Uh, but he was an awesome coach. And it was unfortunate what happened um, through all that because it did it did hurt a guy like Doug from continuing to coach uh, in Canada. Biz, imagine asking that trainer, like your elbow pad breaks, hey, uh, can I get a new one? He just <laughs> you know, Biz, no, Biz would have been okay because <laughs> Biz, Biz would have been Hook's favorite player, right? Because... <laughs> He, he could he relate. Love the way Biz played, right? Like that's what he hated play. me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you would have been in trouble, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I've never, I've never heard of a hockey player putting the slippers to somebody like that. That's crazy. But Brent, during the same era, I, I know you just mentioned you played at one of your brothers. But were there any times you were on the opposite side of one of your brothers in a situation like that popped up during these games? In a fight, yeah, like that. You yeah, know, like a brawl. Honest, you know, the only you no, know, not in a brawl at all, uh, with us being on opposite teams. Like that we never played against each other in junior. We always like we all played in Red Deer and then we all moved from here on to Lethbridge and then we all went from there to the NHL. So we never played against each other in junior, but obviously we got the NHL uh you know, brother Dwayne and I were in the outers, brother Ronnie Ritchie were playing in Philadelphia, so there's four of us. And the first game we played, of course, they make it a big a big big spec you know, a big thing with TV and everything. They got four brothers on the ice, two in each team, and uh, we got into a scrum, and uh, and then all the you know the teammates of both teams would just come in and break it up. Like you guys are brothers. Like what are you doing? Like so nothing ever, nothing ever happened that way where we actually got into a situation where we dropped our gloves and fought each other. No. Uh, Brent, I'm curious. You, you mentioned your first round pick of the Islanders. Um, the year after getting drafted, you played in the WHL with, with Lethbridge. And then just two years later, you played half the year in the dub and then half the year with the Islanders, lit it up, and you go on to win the Stanley Cup. How, were you called up from the WHL halfway through that season? How did that work out? Well, the year before I got called up back in there, the rules were different then. Uh, the Islanders had uh, <laughs> the Islanders had uh, gotten a bunch of injuries, and they came out on a Western road trip. And I was an 18-year-old playing that year in Lethbridge, and uh, half our team from Red Deer went on to Lethbridge along with, along with our coach. So we had 10 players off the Centennial Cup team, plus our coach went on to Lethbridge. Well, and we had we had a pretty good team still, and. Uh, um, anyway, I had, I was having a good year and, uh, and I got the call that, uh, they wanted me to play three games. Um, there was a game in Calgary, then the next night in Vancouver, and then two nights later in LA because Trotch was out, uh, Steve Tambellini wasn't playing. Uh, anyway, they had some center in another lineup and for so brother Ronnie Richie and I, uh, drove up to the game. Of course, <laughs> it's unreal. In it. And, uh, what's crazy about this is that. We play that game, and of course, 
the Calgary Flames are the old Atlanta Flames team. And if anybody remembers those teams, they were massive. I mean, they had so many guys that were, you know how big Clark Gillies was? Well, they had like 10 guys in their lineup that big. Like they were a big team. And the Calgary Corrals were the game that's, they didn't have the saddle dome at the time, uh, which we know what the Corrals like, right? Right across the street. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we go in there. And the one line was Wayne Merrick, Bobby Nystrom, and John Tonelli. And in the dress room, it's a long, narrow dress room that we had to get dressed in. I'm sitting at the back of the dress room with these three guys. Well, we get beat that night 11 4. Al Arbor, who's, you know, Al's like a six foot one guy, but his shoulders are like eight feet wide, right? And he comes in and you got to walk, opens up the door and you got to walk down two steps around the corner. Now you got the dressing room. Well, we're all sitting in the back of the room. Well, Al comes in, walks right down to the end of it, and he's staring at us in this corner. Well, Bobby Nystrom, John Tonelli, and Wayne Merrick were minus seven that night. <laughs> minus seven. Like, we don't get that in a, that's a tough in a night. Year, right? That's, that's a Whitney a night. That's a tough that's night. A, a That'll tough cancel day. out a cup or two. <laughs> he, just, he just walks down, and he looks at me, and I'm like, oh, shit. And he looks at the other three guys, and he says, he just looks at me and goes, you three assholes. And Turles walk out, walks out of the dressing room. So the next night, we played in Vancouver, and we end up winning 5-2. And I had a goal and assist that night. And then the next two nights later, we went to L.A. And uh, we won uh, 2-1. And uh, I got an assist in the first goal and get, scored the game winner with three Oh, left. man. And so anyway, I leave there. And they sent me home after. Al comes in the dressing room, tells the players. I already knew that I was going home. And Al comes in and says, guys, like, awesome, great game. Just some bad news tonight that we have to send Brent back to junior. So I went back and no problem. Then I got called up um, for their Stanley Cup run against Minnesota when we got beat out of playoffs. Uh, I got called up and so actually Kelly Rudy and myself were black aces on that team, Monty Trache. Um, so, you know, Western Canada boys, right? So we we go up there. Well, of course, we're having a hell of a good time. Oh, right? black so, aces is the oh life. <laughs> you yeah. just get buckled. Playing, did it my whole career. <laughs> <laughs> playing three and threes, uh, game days, going to the bar. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, uh, going for cocktails after the after practice and stuff like that. So we were having fun. And anyway, they beat Minnesota. So it was a great experience to learn through all that. It was amazing just to be around the guys, uh, practice with them, um, just seeing what it was like. And then the next year I went, I went back um, to training camp and led the team actually in scoring and training camp. And uh, then Bill called me and Bill Torrey, the general manager, called me and him and Al and uh, just mentioned, hey, Brent, like you had a great camp. We want to send you back, though. We, you know, let's see how the season started. The season goes. I want to be loyal to the guys that won the Stanley Cup. And, you know, you understood that, but you were disappointed. Yeah. Too. Um, so I went back and uh, I had like, I don't know if like 80 some points in 30 games. Or you had 46 was, goals in 34 games. <laughs> So time and, to move uh, on. Yeah, and I, I don't know. And I had like two hundred and some pill. I mean, it was crazy like that. We had a hell of a team, but in a way, I had got named to the World Junior Team, and uh, I got in a call, and they'd mentioned to me that uh, they wanted to name me to the team, and that they wanted me to be the team captain. So I thought that's what I was doing. Well, then Bill calls me a couple of days later and said. Uh, this was like now around that December 10th or so. He said, uh, we don't want you going to the World Juniors. He said, we, uh, we're we going to bring you up for a couple games before Christmas. And then we're going to uh, then we're gonna send you back home and let you spend Christmas, your last Christmas at home with your mom and dad. And, uh, and then you'll stay for another week and we'll call you up on January 4th. So I already had, so I already knew the plan. So... I played, um, and then I got uh, went up on December uh, December 21st. I played in Detroit. December 22nd, I played at home and on the island against Winnipeg. And then I went. Uh, then they sent me home. I got to spend Christmas at home with mom and dad. Um, 
and brother Ronnie Ritchie. Uh, the other the other boys were already playing the NHL. So <laughs> and I I went back to Lethbridge and played a week there, and they called me up on January fourth, and that was it. I, that was it. I, the rest is history, I guess. So who um who was your line in the run to that cup? And that would have been the third straight, right? Well, you know, it's it's funny. I was playing with uh, I was playing with brother Dwayne and uh, and um, Bobby Bourne that year to start with, and uh, the crazy, bizarre how the year worked. The playoffs, like you're ready, go in there, you end up. I don't know what it was, forty-one points in forty-one games or something like that. And then Shell had twenty-some goals and uh, uh, led the team in penalty minutes. Um, then uh, get in the playoffs, and we're playing game one against New York Rangers. And as we all know, growing up, you know, you were you were never taught to be the last man coming out of your zone trying to carry the puck up the ice. And of course, I did that. I was just inside our blue line, and Rob McClanahan, who was uh, a U.S. Olympian player, um, stripped the puck off my stick and um, went in and scored the game winner for the Rangers. Of course, the Island Rangers rivalry. So we lost the game five four. Nothing said to me after the game. Of course, you feel like a an idiot yeah. and. Uh, I never seen another regular shift. I got two or three shifts a game after that. I played on the fourth line. Wow. You're playing, you're playing against the other team's tough guys. Uh, I never played hardly at all. And, you know, and the guys kept coming to me like, hey, you know, what's going on? What are they telling? I said, nothing, guys. Like, I just got to do my job this way. I'm told to do. I can't. I don't have answers for you, right? So I'm just going to keep playing the way I do. And I'm only getting three shifts a night. I only get three shifts a night. It's not about me. It's about winning a Stanley Cup, right? So, um, so whatever. So we get into game two of the Stanley Cup finals against the Vancouver Canucks. We win game one. Game two, we're up like 5-1 or something in the second period. And uh, we had a power play. And a faceoff was in the offensive zone, in Vancouver zone. And, of course, we got Trotch and Boss and, you know, Dennis Pott, and we've got the power play on the ice. Well, Al comes and taps me on the shoulder and says, uh, go take Trotch off. I'm like, oh, I... <laughs> uh, pardon? Yeah, like, sorry. <laughs> 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 and he goes, get out there. So I went and I tapped Trotch. And, of course, he's aw- Trotch is an awesome team guy, and he gave me a tap on the shin pads and took a face off, and we scored on the power play. And, uh, and I didn't get off the ice the rest of that game. I was out every second ship, played with everybody. And uh, and then we get into Vancouver. He starts me in the opening night lineup in the Stanley Cup Finals Game 3. So the way we go, play the game, take a regular shift. I think it was first star of the game or whatever. And then uh, get into Game 4 and same thing. Play a ton and we win the Stanley Cup, right? You win and everyone's partying in the dressing room after the game. And Jim Pickard... Our equipment manager comes in and taps me on the shoulder and says, Al, Al's nickname was Radar. He said, uh, Radar wants to see outside the dressing room. I'm like, what? Like, we just want to stand a cup. Like, <laughs> Team celebrate. meetings. Yeah. So I, didn't, I didn't like your oh. third third period, Brett. <laughs> so, celebrating with the boys. And he comes. I walk out of the dressing room, and, and uh, he's standing there. And again, he's a broad-shouldered man. And just an awesome guy. And he walks up to me and grabs me right underneath my throat like this and squeezes me like this. And he's got his hand underneath my chin. And uh, he uh, he says, uh, where did you learn from this? And I'm like, pardon? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, what did you learn from this? And I'm like, I'm not really sure where you're headed with this one, but I don't know, like... Winning, like what? What? What are you yeah. supposed to answer, right? And he goes, "I just made you the toughest son of a bitch in this league, and you're going to have a long career. So enjoy the Stanley Cup." No shit, wow! And I played 18 years, oh, you know, and Jesus I Christ. and I was able to weather through a lot of stuff mentally. And you just, you're, it, he really, yeah, as hard as it was, he made me be a great pro and understand the mental toughness part of the game at a really young age. And 
Yeah. So, and then Al was my coach for 10 years, right? He was like a second, I was like a second son to him. He just, or he was like a second father to me, I guess I should say. He was, uh, he was unbelievable the way, the way he was. And, you know, we had great communication there on. I had a lot, a lot of respect for Al. Um, you know, one of the best to ever do it, Al Arbor. Everyone knows that, but it was so different back then, like coaching and things have changed so much. And I know he was probably pretty quiet when the guys asked you if he said anything. You're like, no, but occasionally would he tell guys good job was there pats in the back or really none of that you know what al was al was a great players coach um the guys a lot of the guys in that dressing room had played for al since he came in the league since or since he started coaching outers back and i believe it was in 75 or whatever year it was 74 so they'd already he'd already been their coach for five or six years right so uh al you know al was a very intense coach um but he was also, he had a great knowledge of the game. And um, he, back in the day, guys, like there was no video. Like, you know, you didn't have assistant coaches. He was the head coach and there was no other coaches on the on the bench. So he ran the whole bench. Uh, he was, you know, he, he used to come in with a hockey stick. And uh, if he didn't like the way you were playing, he'd come and drill you as hard as he can with a hockey stick right in the shin pad. <laughs> and then he'd just look at you in his eyes through his glasses and his glasses would hang down halfway down his nose and he'd push his glasses up and all he'd do is look at you and you were like, oh shit. So everybody knew, but everyone had a such huge amount of respect for Al. They loved him as a coach. Uh, you know, I, yeah, he was, he was, you know, Al was, Al was a great, great coach. You know, he just, he, well, I mean, his record speaks for itself, right? For years, he was the second one he was coached in National Hockey next to Scotty Bowman and then Joe Quinville passed out. So, um, you know, it was, uh, it was it was years that you look back and yeah, actually a lot of times you like to have do-overs. <laughs> Guessing Ray Dow was a MASH nickname, right? Yeah. Well, you know, he got his name from his glasses he wore when he played, right? He was a defenseman for the oh, St. No Louis shit. Blues. Wow. Defenseman for the St. Louis Blues, and he wore glasses, and and he had the white strip around the middle of his glasses, so his glasses wouldn't break. And he wore he wore a strap to keep his glasses on, and he played defense. And Al, if you look back on, um, and I don't, they obviously don't, but you look back on it, and you see games back in the '60s and stuff like that. Al was a phenomenal shot blocker. Like he'd throw his face down in front of anything. Like he, when Al was a great defensive defenseman, and he was a big man. Like if you look at some of his highlights and stuff, that is pretty cool to watch. I knew you probably weren't thinking coaching back forty years ago, but how, how much of uh, his coaching style did you incorporate into yours years later? Well, you know what? I think you learn a lot from from all player or all coaches you played for. I think we all do. Um, you know, and uh, but you know, Al was. A, you know, John Chapman, my coach in junior, was a great coach. Uh, he taught me how to be a pro. He taught me how to play both ends of the ice. Uh, Chappie had played in the minors for years, and uh, he coached Lionel McDonald uh, in Lethbridge uh, when they were playing the, in junior A before Lanny went on to the Medicine Hat Taggers, and uh, uh, they were called at the time the Lethbridge Sugar Kings. Um, but Chappie taught me how to, you know, the – the fundamentals how to play the game the right way and I went on and it was just like it was I don't want to use the word easy because it was never easy to get to the NHL but you had such a good understanding of the game coming out of junior you knew and that and Al, Al really appreciated that that's why he put me in a lot of key situations because I wasn't like a young player it had to be taught those things I already knew coming in and uh, um, so I you know I, I learned a lot in junior but Al you know, Al just Al taught you how to be a great professional and uh, and how to handle situations. Uh, um, I had a lot of respect for Al, and yeah, I, I think even to this day, um, you know, there's certain things that I look back on if I'm standing watching practice and your things are going through your head and you're sitting there going, okay, well, in this situation, what how would how would Al do? Um, you know, come up and react to this player for doing this or this and this. And it all, it's, it was always, it's been always kind of a calming influence. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think every coach, I mean, I played for brother Daryl. I played for Mike Keenan. I played for Glenn Sather uh, in Canada cups. Uh, I had other great assistant coaches through the process and you learn from all of them. 
and uh, Craig Hartsburg. I played for Hartsey. Uh, you learn from all your coaches, and I think in they all have helped me in my coaching um, in different ways. Um, but it's funny, like I still use things like Al used to come and shut the lights off on us in the dressing room. <laughs> to- and and you, know, you know, it was crazy, but it was a really, it was a really interesting thing how he used to do it. He would come in and tell us to lie down and put our feet up on, on uh, our stalls. And this would be between periods. And so we'd lie down and put our feet up in stalls. And he shut the lights off and he said, okay, clear your minds and think about something. Close your eyes and think about something this, in this period that you can do great. And so it's, it's unbelievable how it works. Like I've done that with players here and they're like, Jesus, just like it totally resets you. And uh, so it's, you know, the stuff like that, it's still things you can use in the game, even though the game has changed. And, but it's still about focus and mental side of it. Well, I was going to ask about a, a few things. I mean, you always got to have your own little twists on it. Now, did you learn uh, giving the guys wood twigs or, or starting five D man off off the, the to the start of the game from from him, or or was this your own little thing? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that was my thing on the fly. Um, <laughs> you know, the hockey stick thing. We it was the year we won the Memorial Cup, actually, and uh, we uh, we weren't playing very well, and uh, and we only lost. I don't know how many games that year, um, 10 or 12, whatever it was, but we had, uh, we weren't playing well. And uh, of course, you know, the type of team you have and you know, you have a chance to, to be successful, maybe win a Memorial Cup. So we, we were going into Brandon. And so I went to Radar, my equipment manager, and I said, Radar, go down to, to a sports store or to McLeod's or whatever, and just buy 24 wooden sticks. And he's like, what? And this is right when all these, you know, of course, wooden sticks are starting off. Synergies and all this junk. There was still, well, yeah, and there was still, you could still use wood blades on these aluminum shaft sticks, but the full wooden stick wasn't there, right? And so everyone never even, like, these kids weren't, like, we're not using sticks. So anyway, I told him to go down and do it. So we were playing in, in Brandon, and we're down 3 nothing in the first period. So I walked in the dressing room. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just went around and picked up everybody's sticks and walked to the dressing room with an arm full of 20 sticks. And uh, I went and put them in a bag, and I picked up the other 20 sticks, wooden sticks, and I walked in the dressing room, put a wooden stick in front of every player and said, tape your stick, and I want everyone with white blade or white tape on your blades, and I want you to write work on both sides of, the, on both sides of your blade. So we came out the second period with these wooden sticks and had, had tape on our white tape on our blades and with work on both sides and we ended up winning the game seven three. And, uh, <laughs> with and the you wood know, twigs, you know, you know what's crazy about that is that I told them they only get one stick, so we have to practice and play. No one took a slap shot in practice. No one can't Every risk breaking it. Shots. Yeah, because they were afraid to break it because they didn't think they were getting another stick. They didn't know I had another another wooden stick for them if they broke it, but I didn't tell them that. So we didn't lose a game for a month with wooden sticks. Come on, you guys one, kept one, one wooden stick. We didn't lose a game, and you know what was crazy about that was uh, uh, these guys became all, you know, and you got those other sticks. Guys are hitting glass. Every shot was high. Uh, in practice, like it was just like crazy, right? And they use these wooden sticks, and no one missed the net. Everybody was dialed in to shoot the puck the right way. And in games, we our our percentage of shots on that were had increased phenomenal on shots on that because we, <laughs> this is what we used. And they it wasn't about how hard the shot was; it was strictly about placement and. The guys, they wouldn't, they weren't slashing each other's sticks in practice and break them. They were almost scared to lose a stick, and so that's what we did. But the cool part about all that is, we started taping little mini sticks in the store with work on it. We had companies sending us mini sticks done up like that. It was the biggest selling item that year in our store were mini sticks with white tape and work written on them. Every kid in our community had a mini stick with work on it with white tape. It was just bizarre how it worked out. And, uh, 
it became just a, a real big thing and that yeah, the rest well, is history. I, I, I got to ask at what point and why did they get to go back to the other sticks if they were working so well? Well, I didn't think they could make it into playoffs with just one <laughs> stick. So I went in two days to, to, uh, to uh, two games before playoffs started. And uh, I gave them back their sticks, and we didn't miss a beat. We just kept going. So, so I, I called, uh, you know, one of my favorite ex-teammates, Colby Armstrong, who you had the pleasure, I'm sure, of coaching in Red Deer, and he told me a hilarious story. He's like, "Oh, ask him about the time I threw my helmet at him in the wet in the WHL finals." <laughs> well, we were playing Portland in the finals, and uh, we were in Game Two, and we won Game One here in our building. Game Two, we were up like five one or something early in the third and Kobe took like three minor penalties. Um, he was, he was one of those guys that when you went and go check them, you know, that hit where you hit him back. Yeah, reverse hit. About checking. That's all reverse he did, hit. but he did it with his elbow. Yeah. <laughs> so he got these elbow penalties all the time. And so I was like, and we ended up winning the game. We scored an empty net goal and won like six, four. It shouldn't have been that way, but we did. And they'd gotten two or three power play goals on us with Kobe in the penalty box in the third period. And, so we go into Portland, and it's game three, and uh, and Kobe took two minor penalties for the same Jesus thing. Jesus, Army. In, yeah, in the first period. So I was pissed. So I go in the dressing room, and I said to my assistant coach before I went in there, I said, watch this. <laughs> I said, I'm going to get Kobe's, uh, get him rattled, but he's going to go out, and he's going to play like a stud the rest of the night. So I went in, and I just said, Kobe, like, are you scared? Like, are you like, are you a pussy? Like, this is, is this, is this what you play? Like, are you scared to get hit and make a play? Like what? And he stands up and he looks at me and I'm at standing. And now imagine the, it's a rectangle dressing room and you got stalls at the end of the dressing room, stalls on the side. And where I'm up, where I'm standing, there's a whiteboard, big whiteboard. He stands up and he goes, I'm not fucking scared and I'm no pussy. And he took me, <laughs> threw his helmet right at me, went right by my head, hit the whiteboard. I looked at him. I walked to the dressing room and I looked at, at uh, Dallas and I said, you watch, he's going to be unbelievable. He was star of the game. The next two periods, he was lights out. And you know what? He was awesome from that point on. Oh, and, shit. Uh, and that's the story. Like, I, like it was just. You got him fired up. Things that oh, and I love Kobe to death. He's a good man. And. He was a great player and he played, you know, he, I don't know. I just, we had a really good team then. And I, I was really close to, to the guys. And even to this day, you still connect with a lot of them. Um, Kobe is on TV. I'll text him every now and then say like, what the hell are you talking about? I can't hear what you're saying. You're just, you know, you're just stumbling through your words. You, <laughs> I said, so he was, and then I asked him cause last year you're in the hub. Do you guys remember when they interviewed Kobe he had two jerseys hanging behind him, a Pittsburgh Penguins jersey and his Red Your, Red Your Rebels jersey. Well, this year, he doesn't have the Red Your Rebels jersey. No right? shit. So, so I kind of give him a shit about that, too. I'm like, yeah, you forget where you came from, bud. So. <laughs> uh, hey, I got to go back just quickly because we, we kind of jumped away from the Islanders and you won that fourth straight cup, the Islanders did against the Oilers. And um, I, I, I've talked before on the podcast about Gretzky mentioning, like, they left that, that night and they saw all you guys icing, icing down and kind of realized, like, what it took to win. And you come back and you're going for your fifth straight and, and the Oilers t took it down and they got there first. And did you notice when that series started, it was a way different Oilers team than the year prior? I know the guys were a year older, but did you kind of realize we, we were, were in one here going for that fifth? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. you look at the year before when the Edmonton was a dime, like all, had all these great young players, right? Gratz, Mess, Curry, Kevin Lowe, Paul Coffey, Grant Fear, Glenn Anderson, <laughs> on and on and on, yeah. right? Like, yeah. The you know, oxygen of pantry. <laughs> only, only all superstars, right? And, uh, and of course, we had a great team, too. And uh, we were playing Boston in the semifinals, and it was game six in Boston. And the Oilers had already won their series. And I believe they they swept somebody. I'm not sure who it was. And uh, um, the media in the pregame, after the pregame skate, the media were like, well, there's no team here like in this division's ever, or this conference is going to beat the Oilers. Like, it doesn't matter whether you guys win this. You guys are going to be done too, right? And that, that just fired us up, right? You taught, you're yeah. telling the Stanley Cup champions this, right? Yeah. Well, we went out and beat Boston that night, and we were wired. 
for that series to come. And uh, we ended up beating the Oilers four straight. And, and Gretz brought that up. Uh, you know, we all have heard that. And I, I truly believe that. I think they learned a lot from that series uh, on how to, you know, how to be a champion and yep. how to play like Stanley Cup winners. And we had to play them the next year. And uh, we lost the first game, one nothing in our building, won the second game. And that was the only time um, at that point in time. They did it the next year, I believe, with Philly and Edmonton the next year, too, where it was a 2-3-2 series where you played two at home, went into visiting building, played three and then two back home. NBA and style, were, I think. They they beat – they like we weren't even close in the in games three, four, and five with them. The scores were like 6-1, 7-2, whatever it was. Like they were just – yeah, they were – they were on a roll, but you know, in in fairness to ourselves, the team had gotten older. Um, you know, we were we were banged up pretty good. It was a lot of hockey to play back then, right? To, oh to my go god! Force down the cups, the amount of playoff games you're playing, and um, and where our opponent was lights out. Now, of course, and all all the stars, and it it kicked them off, obviously, for them to do what they did after that. But you know, they deserved to win that Stanley Cup. Uh, they were a phenomenal team. Uh, great players um, you know it's crazy I, off that group I played with a lot of them in this in the Canada Cup in 84 and after they won the cup and uh, and Slots was the coach and so you got to know the guys really pretty well pretty well like there was Gretz, Mess, um, Koff and myself are for the players that played in all three Canada Cups in 84, 87, 91. So you got to know them pretty well from being teammates of theirs and and just the way they looked at the game. I learned a lot from them too, just in, through the Canada Cup situations. But they were definitely an unbelievable team, and, and they were for years after that. Brent, when they beat you, did you know basically that the, the torch for um, the dynasties had been passed essentially then? Or did you guys think, all right, we can get them again next year? Well, you always want to believe you're going to come back. Um, but then, you know, I think some of the business parts start kicking in too. We started having some contract issues with some players and, um, you know, and then guys started leaving the team. And, and you got to remember something too. The Islanders through those four years were drafting, uh, you know, every year in the bottom part of the draft. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and eventually, you know, your, your talent changes and, um, and that's kind of, I think that kind of eventually winning all the Stanley Cups eventually over time caught up with the Islanders and uh, um, you know and eventually your your level of skill and your team drops off. Um, you know I was there for ten years and when I got traded I was the last for two years on the team I was the last player that ever played in that Stanley Cup the last two years of my career in in the Island. So it was just Al and myself and Bill were the only three. Three people, our trainers had left. Uh, we were the only three people still left from the from the Stanley Cup years. And and in your career, I mean, I think ten or eleven seasons, you know, over fifty points, but fifty and sixty points. And then the one year, 80, 84, 85, you get one hundred and two yeah. points. I mean, was it who you were playing with that season? What changed that one season to just really light it up? Well, certainly with who you're playing with yeah. um, definitely helps. And we it come, we came out of the Canada Cup uh, in the Canada Cup. Um, you know, there was such a, I don't know how to explain it to you guys, but we, of course, you got the Islanders, you got um, John Tonelli, Bobby Bourne, myself. Um, uh, like was, Pot, was Potvin well, there? Was Potvin in Canada I don't think Cups? Dennis, well, I don't think Dennis came to that team. Oh, that okay. He didn't either. No, he didn't. So, and then you had a whole, you had a, like there was seven or eight Oilers, so, um, and there was a lot of I don't just we just weren't the team that we needed to be. We just weren't as close as we needed to be, and uh, um, we had a tough goal through the Canada Cup that year, through the tournament itself, uh, through the regular regular uh, games that we we're playing through the round robin side of it, and what turned it around actually was in Vancouver. Um, we kind of got into well. What happened was the day before we held a meeting, and it was and we were and you guys all know what the Bay Shore, the West End. Everyone's staying there, and we got this big room, and we're all setting chairs up around outside the room, and uh, we had a meeting, and players expressed their feelings about everything, and maybe about some teammates because 
of the Stanley Cup uh, team, and you know, and with the with the Oilers and then beating the Oilers, and I know Bobby was Bobby Bourne was very vocal about some things, and John Tilly brought up a couple things, and the Oilers players brought up a couple things, and uh, but it, it was great because it sorted it out, and we all got kind of on the same page, and then we had a had a big scrum against Sweden between the benches, and of course you got the Oilers and Islander players. You know, now all of a sudden battling with each other, and uh, and it changed changed the whole dynamics. And then we end up winning in overtime against Russia at the Saddle Dome in Calgary, three two. And uh, you know, and there was myself and Johnny and Boss, and uh, Paul Coffey was the one that started that whole play after breaking up a two on one against us, and it went down the other way, and we end up scoring. Um, and then Slats put the three of us together, and. Then we went back to Long Island, and, one, and you guys know, like back in the day, you went to camp to get in shape. Yeah, right. And but <laughs> you three were we, buzzing already. Yep. We were all like in mid-season form. Yeah. So by Christmas time, us and and Al was smart. Al kept us together. Like he, like Boss and Trotch were, a, a, you know, a twosome that played together for all those years. But then when we came back from the Canada Cup, uh, he put the three of us together and. Or kept the three of us together, and uh, there was like by Christmas time, we all had sixty some points. Jesus, um, there was a game we played the LA Kings, and now remember the LA Kings had only won ten games that year, whatever it was, or fifteen games. They weren't very good, and uh, um, there was a game there where we won eight two, and John Tonelli, <laughs> Boss, and myself scored all eight goals. And we all had like six, seven, eight points each for one line, right? And and so those points, when you do that in a the game, they add up, right? And and then I missed the last 10 games of the season. Um, I had separated my shoulder and missed the last 10 games. And uh, I came back for the last game. Uh, I missed 10. They came back for the last game. And, and uh, JT got his 100th point that night. So Boss ended up with 120 some points. I ended up with 100, whatever it was. And, and JT ended up with 100 right on. So amazing. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, um, again, it was, I think it had a lot to do with it, just being in shape when you got there. Like we were in game shape already because we were already been playing these high level intense games like Stanley Cup playoff games. And so we were, we were further ahead. And, and, you know, I was very fortunate to play in that Canada Cup team because that year they named 30 players to the camp. And Brother Brian had got named. And I was training with Brian in Brian's garage in Sylvan Lake um, and working out with them to get him in top shape to, to go there. And uh, so we were pushing each other for quite some time training and stuff because he was obviously very excited to go. Well, they got there. And that was the year that Trotch decided not to go to Team Canada. He used his, he used his treaty card to join the U.S. team instead of Team Canada. So Bill Torrey was the GM in slots. And uh, I got a call from Alan Eagleson. This was, they, they reported on Friday, and this was Monday. And I got a call from Alan Eagleson called me and said uh hey brent alan eagleson here uh you uh we want you to come in and join our team in montreal and i was like f you and i hung the phone up <laughs> i thought it was someone messing with me like i like they'd already named it like i like i wasn't expecting it. i i i that's exactly what i said to him i went f off and i hung the phone up i thought someone was just screwing with me and then about two minutes later the phone rings again and it's bill Torrey, and he says brent that was alan eagleson we're inviting you into into uh, our camp here and I was I was lucky because I had been trained with Brian so I was in pretty good shape so I went in there and I ended up making the team and that was the year that um, Peter Stashney had naturalized to become a Canadian citizen because he was playing in Quebec and so he got named to the team that year too so it was it was definitely unique how it all happened. Um, you mentioned the the situation with the island or not the Islanders um, against the Rangers, and you guys ended up going on to win the cup. Was that the the same year you ended up having the off ice issue with an Islanders fan or a, a Rangers fan? Excuse me. <laughs> Are you talking about after we won the cup? After you won the cup, I don't know if you guys yeah. went to a basketball game yeah. or a baseball game. Yeah, well, it was about four days after, and uh, brother Dwayne and I took our wives to. Uh, 
to the New York Mets game at Shea Stadium. And uh, and we're having some drinks and we're sitting in the stands drinking beer and whatever, eating hot dogs or whatever and uh, that we all do when we go to a baseball game. And uh, both of us have to go to the bathroom. So we get up and we walk to the bathroom and uh, we're standing there at the urns, which men do, right? And there's uh, Dwayne's down and there's a year in between us and there's me. Well, then this person comes in between us, between us. And of course, you kind of look over and you don't even pay attention. Well, then all of a sudden I hear, <laughs> it was pretty funny. This guy turns, instead of pissing in the urine, he turns and he pisses all down Dwayne's leg and into his shoes. Oh, and Dwayne had these, fuck. Dwayne had these white, Dwayne had these brand new white shoes that he bought. Like back in the, like of course, and that's when the designer jeans started coming out and stuff. Instead of wearing Wranglers and Levi's stuff that, well, in New York, everyone's wearing these these jeans and he always wore these cool shoes with them. Well, Dwayne bought these brand new pair. Of, they were like whitish, creamish shoes, leather shoes. Well, this guy filled his shoes right up. And then he turned around and ran out while Dwayne isn't even done. He turns and starts chasing this guy. Well, I walk out and this guy's darting down the concourse. And Dwayne's standing there with piss all over his leg and in his shoes and stuff. And this guy turns around. He's got a New York Rangers jacket on and a hat. And he turns around and gives Dwayne the thing and he goes... <laughs> F you, Sutter, I hate you. <laughs> I kept running. So we go back to the stands, and Dwayne now is like he's mad, upset, obviously, and he's wrecked his shoes. He's got piss all over him, and he's, uh, and he's sitting there, and, and he's stinking, right? So we get in the car, and we drive through the Midtown Tunnel in New York, and the car just reeks with with this guy urinating on dog and he's got his shoes on and i said dog get those shoes off and throw them out because it's off so dog stopped the car took his shoes out and threw them out the window on long island expressway so, <laughs> he got, he got, he got, oh what a uh, piss and run I, I told brother like brother Dwayne's name is dog i said you know dog it just goes hand in hand your nickname's dog for a reason you piss on tires you're on hydrant stuff like this guy pissed on you he just he got even with you oh, oh yeah. sorry for butchering this butchering the start of that one but uh, speaking of nicknames, oh. uh, do people still call you Pukey? Yeah, you know what? I I know it sounds <laughs> awful, but it's been my nickname since uh, I was five years old. I had uh, uh, back home at Viking. Um, we had we, out on the farm. We uh, we had the long bus ride, so we get picked up at ten to seven in the morning and get up, dropped off at school at quarter to nine, and. Back in the days, the roads have all changed now. Back then, it was curbs. You'd take the roads were built around the sloughs. Now they're built through the sloughs, right? So we had an area where we had to go on the bus, and it was bad, hilly, windy road, and it was about a 20-minute, and you had to go pick up two or three um, uh, different homes of kids and then come back and go back in town that way. And I always got sick on the bus in grade one right then. I could not go through that one area of the bus on the trip of our school route. And I got sick on the bus every day for like three, four straight months. Oh, and then, so this is what was stupid about it. So that was my nickname. That's how I got the name Pukey. So, but what really pissed my brothers off, Gary, Brian, and Daryl, is that it didn't matter how cold it was or how warm it was. The bus driver stopped at that corner, dropped me off, and one of them had to get off with stand with me and stand there for 20 minutes while the bus made the trip to come back so I wouldn't get sick on the bus oh. and take us to school. So it didn't matter what there was, minus 40 or, or minus 30 or plus 30. It didn't matter. They had to st One of them had to stand there with me because I was their younger brother and I was only in grade one. So that's how I got the name Pukey. And to this day, everyone at home, that's all they know by me. And I, I mean, I... I'm just used to it. It doesn't doesn't really matter. When I went to the island, they started calling me Pup because Brother Dane, Dwayne's name was Dog. So they just started to call me Pup. So in the hockey circles, I was known as Pup. But in real life, my nickname is what it is. <laughs> Brent, I want to bring up one of your teammates you mentioned already, uh, goalie Billy Smith. If, if I, there was a prototype for the crazy goalie, it was probably Billy Smith. I think he had two seasons where he only had single digit penalty minutes. Uh, what was what was it like working with him, playing with him for basically a decade? 
Oh, Smitty was awesome. You know, Smitty was Smitty was a goalie, but great guy. Um, you know, great teammate. Like that, he they always said he was the money goalie. And you know what? The bigger the game, the better this man played. And uh, but in practice, if you shot the puck over his waist, oh boy, <laughs> he would come with his stick and just drill you with his stick. So you had to shoot the puck from waist down or he'd be pissed off. So everyone knew that in practice. You knew you couldn't shoot high and spinning in practice or he'd, he would friggin' lose his mind. But then as we got close to playoffs, he completely would change his attitude. He'd be pissed at us for not trying to score. No shit. And, uh, and then he was a battler. Like that's why he called Bi- Billy Battler Smith. And he would just be, yeah. And he played like that. Like he, he was a gamer and, you know, it's crazy how his routine was when he played. Like I sat next to Billy in the, in the dressing room on Long Island for years. And there was always one stall between him and I, and I knew not to mess with the, that stall between us. Like, as you know, as a player, the way goalies are, and he'd come in, get his, uh, put his underwear on, set his goal pads down on the floor. And, and back then, um, you guys, you guys know what the lockers were like, right? They're not like today where they're open on the sides. Back then, they were boxed in lockers, like they had the sides on them. Uh, you couldn't see the guy sitting next to you if you sat back in your locker. But Billy would sit back in his locker, and I would make sure when guys came, because it was right beside the door that walked out, that no one touched his pads. Like, do not even touch his pads, or else he'll come up swinging, right? So I'd always be like, guys, like... You know, I was like, it was crazy. But anyway, he 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 read Louis L'Amour, those Western books. So he'd sit back in his stall, grab the book, and lean back in his stall so you couldn't see him. And he read the book. He never even listened to one meeting. He read the books <laughs> through the meetings. He never, Al just ignored him. And he just sat there and read his book while the meetings were going on. And he didn't even... He didn't even listen to any meeting or nothing. He just read his book, and that's how he prepared to play. Very calming guy in the dressing room. Didn't say much, but uh, awesome guy, like awesome off the ice. We had a lot of fun together. Um, good man. Um, I, I have I have a lot of respect for Smitty because he was he was a gamer, and he, you know, he had his ways of the way he practiced and stuff. But there was one time that. Uh, he just took off off the ice because someone shot the puck and hit him in the chest instead of keeping the puck. And he just went right to the door and skated off the ice. I'm not practicing with these guys. And he played the next night and got a shutout. You know, that's just the way he was. And that's the way the game was back then. Now a player gets, you know, sent down to the minors or he gets suspended or fined or whatever. But back then that wasn't the case. Uh, Brent, we could talk to you about oh, five hours. Six Jeez, more this, hours. Is, this is great. But when, when you retired, I think it was a year off, and you got right into coaching Red Deer, and all of a sudden, after a few years and a Memorial Cup and a WHL championship, you're, you're tagged to coach the Canadian World Junior Team. And sure as shit, you coached the greatest team to ever probably play with Bergeron, Perry, Weber, Getzlaff. It was just that list. And then you win it again in 06, first coach to ever win back-to-back gold medals for Team Canada. Why did you choose not to go for the third straight? I, I read it was your decision to not, to not go back and go for the third. Well, you know what, it was, uh, you know, it was just a long time to be away from your team. Yeah. Like, right. Like you're, you're leaving on. And back then it's different is now. Um, when I got the position in 05, uh, I met with Bob, Bob came and met with me, Bob Nicholson and just said, Brent, would you, uh, would you want to run our program and coach this team for this coming season? And, and I just asked him, I said, well, what's it entitled? Like, what do you, when you, talk to me about this like do you want me to coach it or what you know he said no I want you to change the culture they hadn't won the they hadn't won the gold medal in seven years and he says we want you to run it just like you do Red Deer so and when I when I when I bought the team with the Rebels uh everyone said well you know geez you name yourself coach general manager whatever whatever bus driver um yeah (laughs) but I had paid the most money for a junior franchise that was ever sold to that point in hockey and I could not afford, I had put my whole, like we didn't yeah. make the money. Obviously you guys know that these NHL players make now, like 
I had my whole life savings. I put my farm, everything up for collateral. Wow. It's a ballsy move. That's, inc- that's crazy. I could, I could have lost it all. Right. And, uh, and I had a bank that backed me. Uh, we did a 10 year loan agreement and, uh, and as I paid it off, they would take my land or my house or whatever off as collateral. So I kept doing that. And, um, and I couldn't afford to pay for a coach or general manager. I hadn't, I didn't have a choice. And, um, in a way, and just how it all worked out I, in, and in our press conference, uh, I, I don't, to be quite honest, I can't believe I even said it, but I did. I said, we're going to win the Memorial Cup within three years with oh. this team. And we won it the second year. And I didn't even know the players. I just, we had two players. I helped Terry Simpson was a coach then. And uh, Wayne Simpson was a GM. And they were partners with the team that owned the team. And they're the ones that sold me the team. And uh, I helped them a little bit through the year that year, uh, just practices and stuff. And, uh, uh but I really liked some of the players, like the young kids were good players. Uh, but I knew they had their list was really good. And uh, I went around and watched some of their players and seen that the list was really good. And the next year, when we won the Moral Cup two, two years later, we only had two players from the team that when I, the first year I coached them in 1999-2000 season, uh, we only had two players in the one season back. So the whole culture had to change some. And, uh, and we worked at it. Uh, so when I got named 05, I got named the coach there, and um, we had to change. Like, it was scary. Like I went the first day, I went down in the dressing room. I was like, "You got to be joking!" I mean, there was there was more people hanging around the players in the dressing room than there was actually players. Really? It, it was just terrible. And and you know, you got all this all the equipment companies and stuff like that. And they're all they're right in the dressing room, and I I just I shut everything down. I just came in and said no. You, nothing's happening inside this dressing room. Only people allowed in this dressing room are the players, coaches, and trainers. That's it. If you want to do media, it's outside. You want to do whatever, it's outside. These kids got to learn and understand the focus point of how this has to be done. And and it was definitely a change. Um, and we had a great team, right? Like, you think about that old five team. We had 13 players coming back from the old four team when they lost in the gold medal game. Um, and it was just, you know, I just met with the 13 players. And the first thing I did, my first position that uh, Bob and I talked about after he, uh, we made the decision that I would move forward with this was I hired Pete DeBoer. And uh, Pete became my co-coach. And, uh, and then we hired Jimmy Halton and as their assistant coach. And, um, and Pete was in the very same mindset as myself and the way things had to be changed and done. Yeah. And uh, we worked closely on it all. And, um, you know, and we met with the 13 players that we returned and we just said, hey, guys, this is the way it's got to be. Uh, this is what, what, what we want to see happen. And you guys can be part of it or not. Uh, but when they when they when they joined in to be partners in on it, and that's what I say it was it was a partnership right there. They joined in and said, OK we'll do it this way. And so we knew that we just had to pick seven players or I guess it would have been nine players that would mix with these 13 guys to make our best team. And it's crazy how it worked out because we went into our last exhibition game. We're playing in Winnipeg against uh, the University of Manitoba and Corey Perry, it was a do or die game for Corey because he had really struggled through camp and stuff, but everyone, you know, knew that he was a good player and he was just having a tough go with it. But we had other players that we had two players, actually, uh, um, Eric Fair and uh, Ryan Stone. No, was it Ryan Stone? I forget his, his first name. He played, they played Brown and they're one, two in scoring in the Western Hockey League. And uh, it was coming down to one of those three guys to make the team. And Corey had three goals and three assists that night, and we won six <laughs> one. And so it was an easy decision, right at that point. But when you think about that team, and then, and then that was the lockout year, so we had all these stud junior players on our team. That if there would have been NHL hockey, there's probably seven or eight of them would never played in that team. That would have played yeah. in the NHL. Like you look at our defense, like Dion Phaneuf, Shea Weber, Braden Colburn, uh, Brent Seabrook. Jesus. Um, you know, and uh, you look up front, uh, Bergie got sent to us 
from the American Hockey League because the year before he plays an 18 year old for Boston and then there was a lockout so he could play in the American League well they sent him back to us to play in the World Juniors so then our our one line was uh uh Patrice at center ice with Sydney and that's pretty cool right even to this day every international event they play on they play together mm -hmm. but it all started in that World Juniors right and uh I kept them or we put them on a line together and then uh uh, we had uh, Corey Perry playing with them, and then we had Ryan Gesslaff, Jeff Carter, and Andrew Ladd on the next line, and then we had uh, Mike Richards, Anthony Stewart, and Nigel Jaws as our third line, and then we had Clark MacArthur, Colin Fraser, and uh, I'm trying to take the Dixon boys. Was it Steve Dixon? Name. Steve, Steve Dixon. Dickie yeah. was on that team. Yeah, Dickie made that team. You're talking about yeah. getting the right uh, the right spice, and yeah. I think that he knew yeah. Sid from from growing up, and he yeah. was such a good team guy, great guy to have around, good penalty killer too. Yeah, he was awesome. So that was our energy line, and uh, and then the thirteenth player that couldn't play forward, that couldn't play, that got hurt was Jeremy Jeremy Colt. He, he Jeremy hurt hurt his knee, and. Uh, he, uh, he wasn't able to play, but we named him on the team anyway. And then on our back end, it was like we had, like I mentioned, those guys. And then we had uh, Cam Barker was the only 18-year-old player on the team. Everybody else was 19. And uh, we had uh, uh, Sean Bell. Yeah, he could skate so well, that guy. Yeah, and then uh, Danny Severette. And uh, that was our defense. And then goal, we took two goalies. We weren't. These two goalies, we didn't. They weren't even. They didn't get invited to our August camp. We at that time we thought, okay, let's take the two best goalies in our country that know that they might only have to stop 15 or 20 pucks in a game. So they got to be mentally strong and they got to come from good defensive teams. And we took the goalie, uh, for, um, Trevor Glass from uh, from Kootenai. And the Boschman boy from Prince Albert, they're the best two de defensive teams in the league. And those teams were only giving up 15, 20 shots a game. And you know, we didn't give up a game more than 15 shots at the World Juniors. Like we were, so we needed guys that could to keep themselves in the game and be mentally good. And uh, yeah, the kids were fired up. Like we went into, we went into uh, North Dakota. We drove down from Winnipeg and that team was wired. Like we, they wanted to, the year before was not what they were expecting wanted and they were dominant of course you look at that team i don't think anybody can argue saying that they're not the that's you know oh my god you look at those guys like those guys all in the national hockey league were all stars some of them are or have been captains on their teams for a long long time um you know it was just a phenomenal group of young men that were great players that became a real close bond we kept things tight just amongst the team as far as outside uh distractions and uh full marks to everybody for doing that like it was it was a huge commitment by everybody but those kids dialed in and you know and to this day you know that that group of players was very unique and was a phenomenal group and and that was the year sydney got drafted like sydney sydney was 17 that year but him and patrice set the tone on how practice had to be like those guys they treated every practice like it was a game like it was unbelievable so it made of course those guys being such you know phenomenal players at that age it really pushed everybody else to a different level too right so as a as a coach it wasn't a hard team to coach in that sense it was just it was just getting everyone to check their egos at the door and let's just become this type of team and I think we only gave up six goals or whatever it was the whole tournament scored 40 some and then next year we only had one guy cam barker came back in 06 we had to start with a whole new group <laughs> and we won again <laughs> unbelievable yeah. well brent i mean listen we said we could do this for a while we've kept you long enough we'd love to do round two i uh, army said you have a beautiful place on uh, lake sylvan and maybe maybe we'll just invite ourselves over sometime when we go to the <laughs> hey, I love, i'd love to have you guys hey awesome i listen to you guys often and i really really enjoy it so no this was a blast for us it's a pleasure it, so. hey brent you sold enough mini sticks you get a place on the lake eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah they're hanging up and they're ha hanging up in my man cave some of them <laughs> <laughs> well we, we thank you once again and that was one of uh one of our top interviews so oh, man, we'll have so a great fun. one good luck the rest okay, of the guys. year
Thanks a million, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Brent. Appreciate you listening. Take care. Take care, guys. Take care. Huge thanks to Brent Sutter for coming on with us, man. We really didn't know what to expect. Sometimes you, you get a guy his age on, and we really don't know what we're gonna what get. What we're gonna get, man. Biz, that was all time, dude. Just incredible stories you just don't hear anymore these days. Nice to get a little Islanders talk too. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if he knows we just despise them. Shout out Islanders. You know, I'm a man. I'm a, I'm a man of honor. You guys are rolling right now. You don't always want to be peaking this time of year, but you're rolling. <laughs> Did you watch that with CBS Sunday Morning that new show? Uh, no, I don't. But my mom does not miss an episode. Yeah, oh, it's and definitely the times, the times that I have watched it, there's always some interesting discussions. Yeah, it's, all, it's a good show. It's definitely like guys like uh, my father's age and shit watch it, but it's a, it's a wicked mellow show to ease, ease into Sunday morning with like a nice cup of coffee with. Uh, Is that what you're calling it these days? <laughs> death wish. Uh, a couple of the notes from the uh, North Division. Uh, we want to congratulate Montreal's head equipment manager, Pierre Gervais. He worked his 3,000th game on Saturday night. He's been with the team since 87. That's 31 seasons. Man, that's – these guys, we said it before on the show, these guys are the, the kind of grease in the gears that run the league biz and without them – you know, the luggage doesn't move. The, the jerseys don't go anywhere. They're, they're such an essential part to running an NHL squad. Lots of travel, um, lots of late nights being away from your family. Those, those guys are – those guys, like, when you get off the road, they're at the rink till 4 a.m., and then they're there at fucking 7 a.m. to start up. Some, most nights are probably even sleeping there. I don't know how these guys do it. Um, they're they're the, the unsung heroes, that's for sure. No doubt. Uh, congrats to Connor, Connor McDavid. 50 points he got to in his 29th game. Only two guys in Oilers history have gotten there quicker. A couple of fellas by the name of Yari Curry and Wayne Gretzky. So Connor still chugging along. Uh, we're going to talk about the Calder Trophy. We're going to jump into this. Pierre Lebrun, he tweeted about a week or so ago, uh, love watching Kaprizov play. He's so special. Happy for Wild fans. But when it comes to the Calder, do we need to reconsider the criteria? He played half a decade in the KHL. He's a season 23-year-old. Is he really a rookie? He is according to the call, the criteria. This got a little bit of buzz online. Um, I've been, I feel like I've been hearing this a lot from Canada about how, how much he played in the KHL. Uh, what, what do you make of this? Should the call the criteria change or stay as it is? Oh man, I'm not necessarily ready to make my decision on that, but for right now, I couldn't disagree more with people dogging him. Like he can't, I mean, he, he counts. He's by the way, he's not even, he's not 25. Like what, what is, I don't know what the cutoff is. Maybe it's 26. He's 23. And yes, he's played in the KHL for a long time, but he's young enough where man, the KHL, it's, it's good league. It's not that good. You're still in the NHL. It's first year in the show and, and you're dominating. And he's like running away with that trophy. He's so sick to watch that kid. Uh, my buddy from Minnesota, Miser, Justin Miser, my dog, uh, this guy has to come on the show. Everyone pressure him. This guy was, uh, I was at the national program with him in Ann Arbor. And then we went to BU together. And then he went to the WHL. He left us. But he's coming on. He has many stories, many stories about, about us growing up together. But the reason I just went into that is he texted me. He goes, he's like Sergei Fedorov. I love watching him. And the other night I watched the goals. I didn't see him all live. But the next morning, like he scored that hat trick. Third goal, he's like on one knee, right? As he just rips it shelf. Zuccarell gave him the pass. They have sick chemistry together. Yeah, they do. So I know I'm getting away from the rookie of the year uh, discussion, but in terms of like, if you're going to switch up the rules, I don't really know where you'd start. Like if you're going to already have an age on it, like how do you, like if you're in another professional league, like if a guy plays in Switzerland for five years and come, comes over, like that's not, that's not as, as as impressive. I don't know. I, I I'm not ready to say, but I, I I can't right now at all chirp the 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 probability that he will run away with that trophy. I was okay with the criteria at one point, and then uh, and then Friday happened, and he put a fucking three piece up my hoop from the Coyotes game, and uh, now I think they should change it, and I think think they should change it right now, mid season, so and we give it to our boy Jimmy Stu, and not. Kirill the thrill. I tell you what, he fucking, he's unbelievable in the offensive of his own uh, using behind the net. He's always going behind the net to make a play, like either come out and fire it or find guys. So it's, uh, it's been impressive to watch. And as you said, Whit, he, this kid's running away with the Calder trophy right now. And Grinelli, when you put up the poll or so, somebody put up the poll on spit and chicklets, uh, Twitter, how they're wearing the old North stars unis. Right. And, and, and like, should they go back to this? Was the resounding answer? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Oh my God. The wild. 
I think if the Wild went to those unis along with this kid this year, it's like, whoa, I think we have a uh, we have an Anaheim Ducks going from the Mighty Ducks to the Ducks, from the purple and the maroon to the to the or the green to the black and orange, and then they win a cup. Minnesota, you got to get rid of those unis. They, I think they would have to make a, a deal with uh, Dallas does because technically really? Dallas, D- Dallas still owns uh, the rights. Cause, and cause I know this cause when I went wow. to a game in Dallas, I actually bought a Minnesota North stars hat at a Dallas does game. So they still own the rights to all that stuff. So yeah, they would have to buy. Show buy me the money. Yeah, hey, exactly. show me the stats and, in my face with that. All right. I love that. And just to go back the eligibility for the call, the trophy to be eligible, a player cannot have played more than 25 games of any single preceding season, nor in six or more games in each of any two preceding seasons in any major professional league. Beginning in 1991, a player must not have attained his 26th birthday uh, by September 15th of the season in which he was eligible. That was a rule because all the Russians started coming over. They were 28, 30 years old, and and that's when they instituted that This just popped up in my head. I want to say the last time this kind of became a a bit of an issue, but he didn't end up winning it, was, was Panarin, wasn't it? When he was with Chicago? Like he had, uh, he had an unbelievable. Possibly, se- yeah, it was a similar type transition over where he played for a little while there. Where, yeah, where, where so, some people thought that he should have won it, but at that point it was such a close race that people felt that the fact that he'd played in the KHL for as long as he did and how old he was when he came into the league, although still under the criteria of the age of of twenty six, I think that that people people assumed in the voting situation that it was being held against him in this situation he given did the win, fact though. Panarin won it yeah oh fuck well then shove that up my hoop <laughs> i think we've all owned each other once this episode yeah well there you go sounds about right <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Kaprizov, he has been unreal, man. What's he got going into tonight? I thought the, I didn't think that he won it that year. Who did he beat out as far as rookie of the year? Uh, that year, I, I it was 2016. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Yeah. I really couldn't right now. I can pull up the voting in a second. Um, but either way, I don't think. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's not like you said. What he's I in think the cage. David. It was McDavid, wasn't it? Yes, it was McDavid right here. McDavid and Shane Gostas Bear were the other finalists. The coast. So Panarin won Rookie of the Year over McDavid. Yeah, he got hurt. Yeah, he was Remember hurt. Right? Oh. Busted his shoulder up. Brandon okay. Manning. Yeah, maybe that. Maybe that's why I, I got fucked up Brandon by that. Manning year. All right. Well. Yeah, like you said, he's coming over. Stay, stay up, is tough. The KHL minus. isn't isn't the NHL, and he he's coming over and he's getting it done. So I I don't see why he he should be penalized for it. I mean. I don't know. I mean, if you're voting, then you, you don't have to vote for him. That could be your reason not to vote for him. But anyways, yeah, I hope they hope they don't change anything. All right, moving over to the West, LA Kings. How about this? The goaltender, uh, Troy Grosnick, he won his NHL debut back in November 16th, 2004. He won 2,306 days before he won his second NHL game. Uh, he won it uh, March 10th. Uh, that's absolutely insane. He got kind of a spot start. Cal Peterson couldn't go, so they threw him in there. Uh, I know the Kings lost today, but they're another team that's been a bit of a surprise. Uh, also, we got the Eric Carlson comments f- from that division. I know we mentioned the Sharks earlier. Uh, he had said the other day, quote, obviously I did not sign here to go through a rebuild or go through what I did for 10 years in Ottawa, but it is what it is. I think we need to find a way to build with the core group that we have here and figure out a way to how to be competitive in the upcoming years, end quote. Um, Doug Wilson had mentioned he called it a reset, which I don't know. It's just a, another GM term for a rebuild. Uh, but this you think this marriage ain't built for long guys, but who's going to take on that contract going forward? Probably well, nobody. I think that sometimes like, it's hard, man. You're getting asked these questions, and I know he, he speaks pretty fluent English, English, but uh, well, I don't. Uh, but sometimes you know you say things and they get taken out of context. I would just say some because some Ottawa fans were pissed. They're like, uh, 10 year rebuild, like we went, we were one game away from going to the Stanley Cup finals, kind of thing. So I don't know. It, it's just that there's there's probably a lot of pressure on these guys right now, given the fact that things have not worked out that the way they expected. Um, I, I'll, I'll I'll probably just chalk it up to to maybe just a um, a misspeaking wit. Is that fair to say? No, I don't okay. necessarily agree with you. Just because, for the most part, they sucked. <laughs> I mean, they had a couple good years, but he's he's looking at it like when he's all he means is that when he signed with San Jose and now his game is definitely an issue. Right. But what I'm just saying, his opinion or my guess on what he meant was 
when I signed with San Jose, I thought we'd be like a top team in the West. Yeah. And we'd be like competing for cups. Whereas in Ottawa, yeah, one time we made a big run. But other than that, we were like kind of shit. Fair. <laughs> fucking I just, yeah, sorry, fucking I dunk in your face again. Yeah, well. Um, Jesus, Ve- I'm just taking L after L this pod. Vegas is going to be without uh, defenseman Al- Alex Petrangelo for the foreseeable future with an upper body injury after blocked a shot. It looked like he might have fucked up his left hand, so he's going to be out for a stretch. Uh, our buddy Jordan Bennington out in St. Louis, he signed a nice little six-year, $36 million extension that kicks in next season. We'll take him through the 27th season. He's got a no-trade clause for the first three and a uh, modified no-trade clause for the last three. So congrats to Jordan. Gets that security he's looking for. I mean, you can't be out chasing fucking extra dough these days, guys. But with the flat cap, I mean, you, you know, bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, or in this case, 36 in the hand is worth two in the bush, I suppose. Yeah, he bet on himself. He, he took that – I, I, it's hard to call it a bridge deal, right? The one, the last one he, t- he took, although he might have been restricted at the time. But what he signed two years at four million a year, I think it was and he four, ends up, four. Seeing, yeah, he, he ends up getting his payday, man. And I'm happy for him; he's earned it. And he, he had a, a really good start to this year, and I think that's a very fair contract. And they're going to be happy with it moving forward. I think he's got a lot of game left, and, and this is a good deal. Yeah, I'm very happy for him. Just after interviewing him right and like he he had to really put his balls on the line and like stand up for himself at a time when he thought he could just be lost in the in the world of professional hockey where there's plenty of goaltenders who have probably like maybe had not as many chances as somebody else and could have ended up making it so he's ended up making it and that's a well-deserved raise uh, sets him up for life and happy for him all right once again well said wit dog Hey, when it comes I'm to you, crushing it tonight. You are crushing it. When it comes to your chiclets, make sure you're digital and not analog, and get yourself a Bruch electric toothbrush. Dentists recommend them because they're proven to be more effective. Also, Bruch gives you that just left the dentist clean feeling when you're done. They have six unique models to customize your brushing experience: a four-week battery life with a magnetic charging stand and compact travel case. And with the subscription program, you never forget to change your brush head again because Bruce ships you new replacement heads every six months so you're never stuck using a worn-down brush head again. My favorite part is the nice, sleek design. Bruce's electric toothbrush has a modern, aesthetically pleasing, pleasing design. It comes in trend-driven seasonal colors and looks great on your bathroom counter. Right now, you can get 15% off your Bruce toothbrush kit and refill plan when you use the promo code Chicklets at Bruch.com. That's 15% off using the promo code Chicklets, C H I C L E T S, at Bruch.com. That's B R U U S H.com. You want to take care of those chicklets? You want to look good? By all means, check out Bruch. Uh, speaking of the Islanders, poof, nine in a row. Uh, Frankie Bro is going to be owning you soon with nine in a row. Uh, want a little bit of. A little bit of tough news. <laughs> Anders Lee, he's out indefinitely, lower body injury. He had a uh, collision with Pavel Zaka the other night, kind of a tough-looking one. Uh, but this seems like a team that can suffer a loss like that and keep on charging. We've said before, they just kind of roll those lines out. They get an absolutely stellar goaltender from Val- Valamov. Sorokin's kind of settled down a little bit. Um, I mean, when you win nine in a row, you're going to get stroked off on spit and check what's biz. Yeah, uh, they are a fucking wagon right now, and 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 that's really all we could say. Just get everybody's pulling the rope. I saw a couple of games ago they were out out uh, high danger scoring chance. Someone nineteen to zero in in the game, or at least in the first couple periods it was nineteen to what? Nineteen to zero. Oh, okay. I, I Biz, I cannot tell you how much it pains me to say how good they are. You know, I don't like pumping their tires. But they're good. They're very good. Now, like the the crazy thing is, is that it's th- these fans. They're so self conscious and crazy. Frankie Borelli is the perfect fan of the New York Islanders. He's just so nuts and always thinking everyone's out to get him. That it like is basically who they are. And I swear, I know that they're good. But when you try like showing that amazing Barzell goal, I mean, like boring, this ain't boring. I'll fucking stab you if I ever see you, Whitney. Overall, like nobody has a point per game. It's a, it's a do it like four lines deep. Like whether Matt Martin's making the, making the plays one night or Eberly's making the plays the other night, it really doesn't matter. That's why they're so good. But I do get weary and scared if you're peaking right around now. 
I believe they did this at another point. Or no, you know what? They were actually tanking before COVID hit last year. They had lost like 10 in a row or something like that. But Barzell, something else. Anders Lee is a scary injury because he's like the guy in front of the net. He's the leader, right? He's like really understands that room more than anyone else is from what I can tell. Like he really is the guy everyone looks to and in front of the net on the power play and just like everything he, he adds intangibles, that's going to be a little scary. See when he comes back. But then I also was reading, I think it might've been Larry book, Larry Brooks's column, you know, up towards his boy, Brooks, Hey, fuck you. Um, he was saying like, maybe uh, Taylor Hall, do they try to trade for Taylor Hall? I don't know. Is that a guy that the Islanders Lou Lou's shown to be nuts? You know, he he'll make a move. He's the guy who went out and got uh, Ilya Kovalchuk in New Jersey when nobody ever even mentioned them as a possible team. So we'll see where they go. And they're not, they're not winning the cup. I'll tell you that. But they're a good hockey team. I don't think they've lost a game at uh, at home in regulation so far. And I think Lou Lamarello became the first ever GM to win a hundred games for three separate organizations. So that's a. I mean. He's one guy who, who I mean, he's just. Do you guys think they can win the cup? Like, if they won the cup, would would either one of you say you're surprised, or would you be like, no, I, I could see that. I wouldn't be surprised at all. You wouldn't I be mean, surprised at all if they win it all. No, I mean, Trotz, his coaching it is what it yeah. is. I mean, the way they play for him, and also Simeon Valamov. I mean, this guy was a forty-five to one shot for the Vesna at the beginning of the year, and I know I know Mark Andre Flurry's the the uh, the chalk right now, but. Well, I'm off at that level. It'll probably be a finalist. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me at all if they ended up winning the cup. If they my, win the cup, I could have to quit. My, my only my only day. doubt is 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 sometimes their offense can really dry up, and that would be my only my, my only uh, doubt in them. But uh, adding adding someone at the deadline would be. I don't know. I don't know if Lou would ever go like go get a guy like like Hall because what would you be giving up as far as an asset? What do you think Hall's value is right now with the season? That I, he's I would have no idea. Honestly, I just read that in in that column and it was just we were just chatting about the Islanders. But no, I didn't. I didn't put too much like thought into it. It was just more something to bring up on the pod. I would think Buffalo is just going to take picks. I mean, you got to imagine they got to. Yeah. I mean, he's going to be UFA. They have to fucking trade and yep. be stupid not to. They'll just yep. get a start stock on the um, what do you call it the cupboard for the future. Well, don't uh, put it past them. Yeah, <laughs> true that. <laughs> and speaking of um, Buffalo, Jack Eichel, he's going to be out for the foreseeable future as well. Uh, his injury is not considered uh, season ending. He saw a specialist, but now he has to go into quarantine uh, for seven days. He's going to miss another four games. So um, when it rains, it pours and snows 17 feet in fucking Buffalo lately. Well, I saw – apparently he's had it – since the beginning of the year and then you saw him re-aggravated i forget what game it was and then the trainer was trying to massage his neck and the minute he touched it you, you could see how much pain he was in and guys like you know neck and vertebrae that's well, something you can't fuck around with yeah just you know that's a that's a valuable valuable asset and you don't want to be messing with uh with that type of shit right now and if you take a look at the top of the standings uh, as of this minute, Islanders, Carolina, Tampa, Florida. I don't think too many people would have predicted that earlier in the season. Um, Washington, they've won four straight, nine of 11. Uh, they might get Hank Lundquist, Hank Lundquist back. It's a possibility. They haven't guaranteed anything, but it's certainly something different. Uh, that's changed in that regard. So I, I and Viz, uh, you, I think, did you tweet who's the most underrated player in the NHL or undervalued, would you say? Oh, I got to go back to that Lou Lamarillo stat. He actually became the fourth general manager on NHL history to earn 100 regular season wins with three franchises. So Brian Burke, Emil Francis, and Brian Murray were other other three guys. I thought I'd read that he was the only guy to do it. So stay, keep staying hot, Biz. And what was your question, Wit? Your tweet was it? Who's the most underrated player in the, in the yeah, league? Yeah, I know that Barkov always comes up every year, but like I watched the game the other night. Like I, I was saying the ends, and like he had twenty five minutes. He played. He's the first guy that they count on as far as power play. Yeah, every, he's every always Saturday. out there killing penalties. He wins face offs. You can't give him a bad pass if you put it in his bubble. He's he's taking it. He's Yans talked about the amount of takeaways. I just feel that this guy is probably and and given with the contract that he's on, I think that he's probably top what top seven or eight centers in the league. And you never hear about the guy unless it's like someone saying like, "Hey, remember this guy down in Florida?" Okay, well, you want to know who else might be one of the top seven centers in the league who you also really don't hear about, and it's been going on forever is the Washington Capitals and Nicholas Backstrom who leads them in scoring. That's why I kind of brought it up. Like 
kind of an ageless wonder. I mean, how has Backstrom been in the league? What for? I don't I know. 14 years now. 14 years. Yeah. Like, oh, and he's still 30 points this year. It's like this guy doesn't slow down and Verona keeps getting better. So when you talk about Washington winning that many games in a row and being on this heater, I don't really see them slowing down. The fact that I didn't pick them to get into the playoffs or did I? Yeah, I don't think I did. What an idiot. Idiot. <laughs> 14 years he's been in the NHL. 14 years. Nicholas Damn. Baxter has been doing this. Enough is enough, Backy. And he's sick at golf. I think just, Louis just, Erickson's just the most underrated biz. <laughs> he he <laughs> that, was the guy for like three or four that. years no, that everybody like would seven mention. Years, people said him. Yeah, then you gotta stop. You got to stop fucking saying it. Uh, I I was just saying Ovechkin got a 716th goal. Uh, he's one behind Phil Esposito for sixth all time. Just want to make a note of that because that's obviously a big. And he deal. has never physically uh, assaulted Bob McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> that we're aware of. Uh, 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 Temi Panarin returned to the Rangers Saturday in their victory over the Bruins. Nice to see him back out there. Uh, hopefully fucking Putin will leave him alone and his family. Threading uh, the needle, too. I think he contributed that sick assist back door. Just buzzing. And uh, Tuka Rask is hurt a little bit, too. He's nothing serious, but Halak's been getting a lot of the play there lately. Um, there was another quote, Biz, I know you want to talk about. Gary Bettman had his annual presser the other day. He stated, uh, I don't believe there's tanking in the game. I think our players and our organizations, our coaches are too professional. Um, I don't I don't think anyone's actually tanking. But what do you call it when a when a general manager is manipulating the roster so it's not the best team he could ice because it doesn't benefit him to be in the middle of the league? I mean, this one seemed to piss a lot of people off. People were like, oh, what do you mean? No tanking going on. And like, I mean, I guess that the the, the draft situation has to is kind of a contradictory contradictory in the way that they set it up to prevent try to prevent teams from doing it to where it doesn't ensure that they end up getting the first overall pick. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would say that there's there's less of it going on now that that rules in place. So wait, what did you what did you feel about the quote? I mean, it just seemed to like he can't come out and flat out say that. Yeah. Teams in the league are fucking tanking. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if before the year, there's 31 teams soon to be 32. There's, there's a number of teams every single season who, who know like, all right, we don't have much this year. Um, you then try to field the best possible team you can. And you try to grow younger players that are, you plan on being a part of your team when it's good. And then for the most part, you take beatings and you take your lumps and it's like the senators at times who can look really good, but for the most part, struggle. And is that tanking? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I think teams like throughout the year, right? When you realize you have nothing going, you start selling assets and then you know you're going to struggle and you're more worried about getting people games and ice time that you think could be a part of your future. And you're not as worried about winning and losing because the games don't matter anymore. You're out of the playoffs. So if that's tanking, there's tanking, but I don't know. Teams let's use beat. Detroit as an example, right? Yeah, so, Detroit's playing hard. You know what I'm saying? Like, is that, are they, they're not tanking, right? So they go out in the off season, they sign a guy like Bobby Ryan. I think they got Sam Gagne and they, they add these pieces to probably help with the locker room too, and show these young guys how to be professionals. And you need some competent actual players to help, you know, win some games and, and make your team not laughable. But at the, at the end of the day, it's like, what type of assets can you trade certain players for once you're at a certain level it's like you 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 really can't you really can't do much else right you could trade trade those guys what are you going to get for like a bobby ryan or a sam Gagne? who does detroit have where they can gain assets for it in, in order to tank and try to try to be that dog shit any any you pending ufas basically i mean you yeah. know you got to think any team would probably take a bobby ryan for, for cheap price going into the playoffs even just to have him on the bench even if you, your roster was fine I would think teams would be beating down doors to get a guy like even like Mark Stahl. Like, I mean, if you're you're looking for defensive depth in the playoffs, wouldn't you want to add a guy like Mark Stahl? I don't know. <laughs> Why? You don't know him? I mean, yeah, look at the roster. We got uh, Luke Glenn Denning, uh, Darren Helm. I mean, you know, I don't know if he wants to leave. I know he had an option to leave last year. He didn't want to. Bobby Ryan, uh, Mark Stahl, I just mentioned. Patrick Nemeth. I mean, you know, if you're, if you're Detroit and you're building for the future and these guys are going to be gone at the end of the year, why wouldn't you take even a fifth, the fifth round to just get whatever you can and just build assets? It's kind of a no brainer, I think. Yep. You know what else is a no brainer? Using earnest. Right now, times are tough and worrying about your student loan payments, they don't make things any easier. That's where refinancing with earnest could help. 
Ernest offers low-rate student loan refinancing, and you can check your rate risk-free in just two minutes. With Ernest, you get radically flexible payments, and you could pick your loan term. By refinancing, you can reduce your loan term, save money, or combine multiple loans into a simple monthly payment. And if you have questions, you can even talk to a real live human at Ernest for help. Isn't it time you stop feeling overwhelmed by your student debt? Now, Ernest is giving our listeners a $100 bonus. Refinance your student loans at earnest.com slash chicklets. Terms and conditions apply. Once again, visit earnest.com slash chicklets for more details. Terms and conditions will apply. Earnest student loan refinancing made by Earnest Operations, LLC, NMLS number 1204917, California Financing Law License number 6054788, 303 Second Street, Suite 401N, San Francisco, California, 94107. Visit earnest.com slash licenses for a full list of licenses. Once again, you get a $100 cash bonus when you visit earnest.com slash chickens to refinance your student loan. Not available in all states. Terms and conditions apply. Um, Biz, just to go back to the draft stuff uh, one second. The NHL did propose to the Board of Governors recently some changes. Uh, reported alterations include limiting teams to no more than two lottery wins in a five-year period, allowing clubs to jump up only 10 spots and reducing picks in the lottery from three to two. Uh, the next draft will likely stay in July. I know there was talk of a delay. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, and another little note, the NHL's last place team has picked first overall just twice in the past nine years. So I don't know. Do you really need to change it if that's the case? I think not. Oh, all right, gang, that wraps up all the hockey stuff. Let's get to the fun shit, all the, all the goofy shit. Of course, we talked about Disney World for the first 20 minutes, so I guess you could say we did it at the beginning. But, boys, we got home. I was waiting to see Coming to America. Well, that's the name of it, Coming to America, the number two. It was the sequel to the Eddie Murphy movie from back in 1988. Now, I had zero expectations. Uh, anytime you make a sequel these days, it tends not to be good, let alone when it's fucking 30, 31 years later, whatever it is. Um, I put it on 10 minutes in. I was out cold. It was probably because I just got home that night. I watched it the next day. It just was not good, man. Um, I'm a huge Eddie Murphy guy. The, it's a classic, one of his classic movies, but it was bad, man. Gee, I know you threw it on too. You didn't last too long. It was horrible. Like it was not a good movie at all. And I'm not critical about movies. I'll watch anything. And this was brutal to watch. Yeah, it was a disappointment. Worse than Dumb and Dumber? No, no. <laughs> It wasn't. Did that you bad. last the whole movie? All right. Oh, don't you not stop watching a movie to like respect the craft? Yeah, kind. Of. I mean, I, I, if I want to give an opinion on a movie, I got to watch the whole thing. Um, I did sit through it, and you know, they try to do the nostalgia thing a couple times because people get roped in with that. But it, it was just the story stunk. It was just, it was just a mess, man. And uh, again, I, I didn't have fucking high expectations. And I watched the Bill and Ted sequel actually when we were flying either down to Florida or back one of the planes I was on the last couple of weeks, and same thing. I mean, you're making a sequel to a movie that was popular 30 years ago. So you got to like touch that nostalgia nerve to get the older folks involved. But pe- younger people don't know it, man. They just don't care. And if the movie sucks, then that doesn't help either. So um, it seemed like they, they were they, forcing they, it too, R.A. They ruin they, it. They, they ruin all these yeah. fucking original movies, man. It's brutal. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's money. I mean, money, I'm sure it made Amazon a lot of money. I mean, they paid whatever they paid for it, but I don't know. Obviously they're not getting at the theater, but they're trying to get it through subscriptions nowadays. Everything's changed too with the pandemic. They're not making money at the theaters like they used to before. Although that should be fucking changing soon. Hopefully. Um, gee, I know we mentioned it earlier, the Kirill, the thrill shirts, they are available on the website. Um, if you want to explain, uh, the process yeah, Kirill put up a hat trick last night. We looked up the most commonly used Kirill phrase on the internet. It happened to be Kirill the Thrill. We threw it on a shirt and they're selling off the hook. So Minnesota people, your savior has arrived. You can buy it at uh, barstoolsports.com slash chicklets. And uh, Gia, are we going to have a behind the scenes video from Jupiter too? I know, I know we did a lot of recording down there. Yes, sir. We have a behind the scenes video dropping, I believe, and, and don't hold me to these exact dates, but I believe we have a behind the scenes video dropping this Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we have the Pink Whitney Putt Putt Challenge video dropping as well. And then the weekend at, or the week after that, we have a sandbagger. So lots of content coming out on the YouTube page. Please subscribe. Like Biz said a couple weeks ago, a lot of our trips are based off the success of the YouTube page. So if you guys subscribe, that means we're having more success. We can do more things. So again, please subscribe. Yeah, you've been killing it with that stuff. Good job, Mike. Thank you. Of course. Attaboy, Michael. 
All right. Thanks, and wrapping up, we got one last story here. This is a big story here in Boston or the New England area. Uh, former middleweight champ, Mar- uh, marvelous Marvin Hagler passed away on Saturday. He was only 66 years old. I know I've, Obviously, the old guy, the crew here with, he was a little before your time, but back Brock, in the 90s. 19- Brockton, Mass., right? Brock, Brockton, Mass., yeah. He was originally from Newark, and then he, he fought out of Brockton when he, when he moved there later. But, you know, back in the 80s, man, I know, you know, we had Larry Bird, Ray Bork, and Jim Rice, Roger Clemens. Well, Marvin Hagel was up there with all these guys in the 80s. Um, you know, those are obviously team sports. He held the middleweight title for almost seven years. He had 12 successful defenses, 11 of those defenses. He knocked a guy out. Just one of the all-time greatest boxes ever. Um, probably the best middleweight ever. I know Sugar Ray Robinson fought in the 40s or whatever. Um, but back in the 80s, when it was the great middleweight era of boxing, there was nothing better than uh, Marvelous Marvin Hager, man. It was genuinely sad to read that he passed away because he's yeah, such an icon. Yeah, very and young R.A. I didn't know he was only 66. Did they say what he passed away from or was it not made public? It hasn't been made public yet. I know I'm yeah. not going to get into online no, speculation. No, no, but for his, sure, for sure. He was uh, 66. He was living in New Hampshire and his, his wife posted online that he passed away uh, suddenly uh, well, in New Hampshire. He, uh, if you get the chance, go right now. And I think a lot of it had been going viral. The first round versus Tommy Hearns. Is that what it was, R.A.? Yep, H-E-A-R-N-S. Hearns. Yep. Oh, my God. It might be the greatest round of boxing I've ever seen. I know Ward Gotti had some crazy rounds, but this is the first round of the fight. Go check it out right now. I don't know. Do you know the year off the top of your head? All right. Um, I, that was 80. I want to say those 85 off the top of my head. Um, but, yeah, it's on the I wrote a blog about okay. it Saturday night, so you can check the blog out on Boston. Oh I, I included the, that first round in the whole uh, sugar. Who ended up fight. winning that fight? Oh, Hagler beat him in like the, I think it was the fifth round, but it was just the two of them were just going toe to toe for that first and, round. And if you watch the first round, not to give it away, I mean, it doesn't not exactly a spoiler alert <laughs> when you're talking about this many years later. But Hearns comes out so hard and both of them do. And I think like there's so many moments in that first round where it looks like he could knock him out. And I maybe maybe I didn't I've never seen the entire fight, but maybe after that he was like, oh, my God, if I didn't get him. That man, was like rough like, and rowdy. Like he probably thought it was only three rounds. <laughs> Just <laughs> just going to town first round, then he's gassed. But, yeah, he, he had an absolute steel jaw. I, I mean, he was only knocked down. I mean, he was never knocked out. Hagel was knocked down once, and even that was disputed from, from what I've read. So uh, just a, a tough-as-nails competitor. I mean, any, like I said, anyone my generation is familiar with Marvin Hagel, but just uh, sad news in the area this week, uh, an icon of boxing, a New England icon, uh, gone at 66. So, so tough news, but it, it is. It has been nice to see the tributes pour out from everybody. You know, it happens in this day and age. Everybody has a, an outlet, so uh, it sucks. What else you got? You boys got this week on? I have one thing, guys. Um, Me? a great article in the Hustle magazine about Pink what, Whitney this week. One? I feel like we got to give a shout out. Yes, uh, Trung fan. We did an interview with him. I know Erica had chatted with him, and Biz and I were on the phone, and he wrote an article about about Pink Whitney and what's been going on there. And, and really, guys, with all the chirping we do on the show, and like we could never have imagined what's what's happened with Pink Whitney and the success we've had, and it's all because of you and the listeners, and then people who you know like. Grinelli did work for the the cover of the you know what what the bottle looks the like. Label. So it's the people who don't even know about the pod, they like the label. It's just we we're so thankful and grateful for for fans going out and like even even trying it when I said how good pink lemonade and vodka was together. So the article was awesome to kind of read and and see like where it's where it's gone is wild. So we want to thank you guys so much. Got excited at first. I thought it was in Hustler magazine about Pink Whitney. I was like, "Whoa!" Oh, you would have had you would have had it in your mailbox already. <laughs> like, where's the te- where's the tequila hunt? The pages uh, are stuck together. <laughs> hey, one final thing, guys. Did you guys see that Justin Bieber music video? Just pumping the Leafs, absolute Leafs porn biz. I'm sure you would plan the your belly button to it. Plan the fucking parade. I've been bullish on the Leafs, although since that fucking video has came out, they don't look very good. They don't. I think they got beat by Ottawa tonight on Sunday. So Matthew I don't know. Smith I don't know. Is, sick, is this though. the Bieber curse? Did did he beat? Did he curse him? We'll find Bieber. out. Stay tuned maybe for can, the rest of the get, season. We can get Bieber on this show. Absolutely not. <laughs> nope. He doesn't give a fiddler's fuck what's going on in Spit and Chicklets. He's too busy. What, what was that last video he came out with? Do you think with Bieber's Pauly? heard of Spit? And, do you think if someone's like, do you know what Spit and Chicklets is? Bieber would say yes or no. Not a chicken dick's chance. I would say I, no I bet chance. you he yeah. absolutely has. He is a hockey fanatic. Yeah. I guarantee you he has I'd heard of Spit and Chicklets. He didn't least hear of it. And guarantee it. Just I don't know. He's got the invite. Justin he can come Bieber. on any time. 
Don't be shy. We'll get him. We'll get him eventually. Um, all right, gang. All right. Well, well, yeah, that about wraps it up, right? All right. So yeah. uh, we want to good to good to good to go. Oh, there we go. All right, everybody. Have a fantastic week. Enjoy the interviews, and uh, we'll check back next week. Hey, and think that's of me, guys. why I was think so dog guys. shit is I got cursed with the Leafs because I've been so bullish on them all season. <laughs> or maybe maybe the fucking Mr. Shvechnikov put a, a hex oh, on. Oh, I put a hex on. You might never be able to podcast again. It, you can't it, until I, I, I have to undo until it with you a do real it again. good one. Yeah. The, minute, it again. The, minute right. we, the minute we hit record today, my brain just took a massive. I was so amped up to do this pod, too. I was, like, I was, I was texting you guys yesterday about it. So my apologies for being brutal. I'll, b- I'll b- bounce back better than other next pod. But at hey, least Biz. we got some great interviews and, and Wit and RA carried the show. Biz, you know what? Accountability is a huge word yeah, in life. Yep. You know what I mean? And I think, that, I think that when you kind of come out and say you struggled, people it resonates with people who maybe that day at their job didn't return emails correctly and didn't do a good job at their desk. And I yeah. think that it takes a lot of honor to say what you just said. But you, you're still our guy. Like Panarin went from not winning the Calder to winning it. Lou was the only GM to fucking win a hundred games with three different franchises when he was actually f- the fourth to do it. Like br- Carlson, I was Carlson, Carlson can speak English. Car- Carl, <laughs> there is no language barrier there. He's probably more fluent than I am in English. Like, let's go through it. Let's go through the whole fucking list, folks. What else, what else did I fuck up on? At least you didn't say Anders Lee was spoke for a foreign language. We could be excited. look at the pause. Yeah, he's yeah. oh he's oh, North that American. was another Anders. Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't even know he was North American. Although when you said he had a lower body injury, I'm like, how? Have you seen the fucking tree trunks on that guy? Oh, yeah, I think I think he was like a world. Like, I don't know world class isn't the right word. I think he was a sick football player. I've heard in in like growing up in Minnesota, like could have played D one football. Really? If I'm making that up, may, I know Paul Martin was the same way. Legendary defenseman Paul Martin, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Skillsy was I a quarterback. Think, I think Anders Lee was a very good football player as well. Skillsy played, yeah. Skillsy was a QB. I was terrible at football. Jesus Christ. I couldn't even. I, I At one practice, I hit my hand on the helmet. You've never seen somebody hate a sport more than me. I that. went to one football practice at Notre Dame High School. And uh, Michael Pitchell, my good buddy, broke his ankle. And I said, nope, nope. Done. <laughs> never showed back up. He was, it was a bad one too. So his ankle sideways, was, you're like, I'm was, out. Yeah. Oh, what was the one that, uh, what was the football player who, the, the quarterback back in the day? Obviously, Joe Alex, oh, it was Joe Theismann who got his career ended? Yeah, yeah. that was like the oh, beginning like of the snap. blind side. Oh, that's, Marge, that's you made it. me miss Joe Theismann. Yeah. All right. With that, guys, um, wish me luck. Think of me. Right? Tomorrow's the day, but you'll be listening to the day after because this is Sunday for us. Love you guys. Peace.